We're sitting here with Tsipora Pora. It's June 11th, 2007. And we're in her apartment in Ganei Tikva. Hi. Uh, I want to start off a little bit by hearing about your childhood growing up in New York. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, childhood. Um, where uh, where were you born? And I was born, born in Brooklyn, New York, actually in uh, Borough Park, which is kind of the B'nai Brock of, uh, of that period. Um, and um, it isn't where I was born, but to whom. My parents were really way out. Um, the focus in our family was Zionism from the moment I was born. I was probably conceived at a young Judea convention <laughs> because my father was one of the founders, original founders of young Judea. And my mother was from the Negev of America, Richmond, Virginia. And if you've seen Scarlett O'Hara, or the movie, or read the book, she was just that. She was beautiful. She was, uh, um, I'd love to get a picture and, and okay. show you, I will, because um, she was bright. She wrote poetry. In 50 years that I knew her, she never learned any Hebrew. But she was an ardent Zionist and wanted to set up a Zionist um, um, a, 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 a section of the Young Judea in, in uh, Virginia. She also wanted to go to law school, but at that time, one of seven children, her father was uh, an immigrant. And when he landed at Ellis Island and they asked you, what do you do? He was a tailor. So they sent him to Richmond where they needed a tailor. So she's in the middle, one of seven children. Also on my father's side, seven children. And as I said, she, I'm, I'm skipping the childhood childhood because um, it all centered on Judaism, Zionism, Hebrew. What were your parents' names? Sorry. Uh, well, all my life I was Borowski's daughter, Samuel J. Borowski, until he came to Jerusalem after the war, and then he was Abba Shulzipi, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which rather put him off. <laughs> Borowski was a um, shame of uh, actually, a renowned name because he was one of a few um, educators who concentrated on the study of Hebrew to promote the study of Hebrew. In fact, uh, the New York Board of Education, in which he represented uh, the Jewish studies, uh, he became famous because, as you may know, in practically every high school and university today, there's either a Jewish, uh, an Israel, or Hebrew Studies Department, and that started with uh, a project that he, um, uh, that he initiated. I was then studying at Hunter College, and he asked me to round up, it was a girls college at the time, um, nine, uh, ten uh, uh, students to make a project for the study of Hebrew. They were going to give us a famous uh, teacher, Professor Ephrus, who was a, a poet and uh, um, and he promised everybody at least to be, you know. <laughs> and so I went around recruiting, but I could only find nine girls. And in the end, my father did what fathers do, took me by the shoulder and said, it is incumbent upon the tenth person <laughs> to make a minion, and you're taking that course, even though I didn't need it. I was a graduate of the Yeshiva Flatbush and uh, the Bendeley Hebrew High School and... A long string of, of uh, there were no boys in our family, so I got stooped with all the Hebrew. My sister resisted somehow. So you went to day school? Uh, all my life I did two things or three at one time. And going back, uh, because of my father's interest in the study of Hebrew, he was sent in the early 30s, uh, late 30s, I'm sorry, late 30s, uh, to set up a network of Hebrew speaking, the Talmud Torah, which still exists in Canada. Um, instead of the Yiddish schools, which were the popular thing then. Incidentally, in very few homes in America where the parents or grandparents spoke Yiddish, um, uh, was Hebrew spoken. I don't know a word of Yiddish. In our house, they spoke Hebrew as the second language. Where did your father's interest in Hebrew come from? Uh, my father was sent over. There were seven children on his side. Uh, they were from white Russia. Rajiva or something, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. And um, they uh, uh, arranged uh, to remove young boys who would be called up to the army as early as possible to ship them off somewhere. So he was sent to America at the age of uh, 10, 11, 12, I don't know, before his bar mitzvah, 
um, or just about that time, with a family named Canterwitz. So all my life I knew of the Canterwitzen, and they were traveling under the name Borowski for some reason. In other words, our original name, excuse me, was Canterwitz, but um, it became Borowski because uh, of my father. Uh, there were seven children, but he was the scholar in the family. All the girls, there were four girls and three boys. The girls were sent uh, to the factories, uh, the, the, what do you call them, the special factories uh, in uh, New York. Sweatshops. Sweatshops, right. And he was sent to, he got scholarships to uh, Townsend High School, to New York University, and he was a very bright young man with a future. So all of the family earned money to send him for an education, and he didn't disappoint because he later became the representative for the study of promoting Hebrew was his thing. And that's how, uh, as I say, my family started because my, I'll go back to my mother who asked the young Judea office in New York to send her someone to help set up a um, chapter. And um, they sent her a telegram in those days. There was the uh, telex of whatever it is they sent, not telephones and not emails. And um, Samuel J. Borowski, who is one of our young visionaries and an excellent speaker, speaker will be arriving at uh, the Union Station or whatever it was. Uh, please pick him up. He will help you and take good care of him. Well, evidently, she took very good care <laughs> of him because three days later, when they had the uh, chapter going, uh, she hopped the train and went back with him to New York, after eloping three after three days. She eloped with him? Eloped with days? him after the three days. Subsequently, my uncle, from her, there was an uncle from the, just got out of the American Army, the First World War. Uncle Sam was sent to New York to fix things up. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is, they were married. And they were the first ones married, although he had three older sisters. And that was not easy. And um, as I said, uh, he was uh, the, the educator in the family. And uh, well, that leads on later on, ask me how I got to Israel, because that was the, the keystone. So as I said, my family, my parents married in this very early age. I don't know how <clears throat> mother was 21 or something, 20 this raving beauty from the South. And all our lives at home, we heard you all. She had this thick Southern accent, <laughs> you know, like in uh, Scarlett O'Hara. Um, and um, although they were very different people, they were both dedicated Zionists. And our whole life was focused on Zionism. Was your family an observant family, a traditional family? No, let me put it this way. My father was a modern um, Zionist. He believed, he didn't like congregational stuff. And to this day, I have trouble with the same thing of organized. You do your thing as best you know how. And his interest was on Hebrew as one of the foundations of Judaism. There's religion, there's the history, there's the peoplehood, and then there is the language. And without that, there is no unity uh, in Jewish uh, history. And that's why he concentrated as an educator on that particular aspect. So as I said, there was this focus on um, um, the promotion of Hebrew. And my father was very instrumental in getting uh, the project uh, going in uh, the Jewish education scene in New York and eventually in the whole country. Were you brought up on Young Judea? Well, my father, as I said, was one of the founders. So he was uh, active in this. And all of this Zionist youth activity stuff rubbed off on us. I became a madricha in Young Judea, also in what was then Masada, Plugat Aliyah, which is the uh, Hachshara part of our unit, of our uh, youth movement. And um, none of us could get to Palestine at that time. You didn't want to deprive a uh, refugee of a certificate. Now, one of our Plugat Aliyah people was a former captain in the um, Air Force, and he marched himself up to the Veterans Administration in Don't Washington. Don't get angry at me. Do you know his name? Dove Pelig. Okay. But it used to be Haber. Now I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dove and Chana. Dove and Chana. And they were our 
uh, our young Kennedys, they were the beautiful people. He was <laughs> handsome, she was beautiful, and they were a, a loving uh, couple. And he uh, marched himself up to the Veterans Administration and says, under the GI Bill of Rights, I'm entitled to go to a university. I don't want to go to the Sorbonne, I want to go to the Hebrew University. And as a result, the Hebrew University was recognized, and so was the Technion. They were the only two institutions that you could get a visa. And that's how the rest of us came. We didn't initially come to study, but we came because that was one way to get to um, Eretz Israel. Let me take you back for a minute. Yeah. Summer camps? My father, as I say as an educator, had in his head this business of summer camps. He, um, I'll have to dig up for you, because many years later, I found the brochure for Camp Kiyuma and Camp Carmelia, which were Hebrew speak. It wasn't the Hebrew speaking camp, which everybody knows as uh, Masad. Uh, but he uh, was the first, call it uh, Jewish uh, oriented, Jewish uh, heritage um, uh, camp. There were CJA camps, there were all kinds, but his was special. Your father founded the camp. My father and mother founded it. My mother was the doer. And my father was the spiritual the director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On my big birthday a couple of years ago, I don't know where my son, who was a, a um, cameraman, a photographer, a dug up in somebody's basement a 1939 uh, tape of Shabbat at Camp Kiyuma Kamilia. <laughs> and there is my father on a horse riding around, rounding everyone up. Like in Jerusalem, they <laughs> ring the bell. Yeah, yeah, and there were seven or eight bunks for the girls and seven or eight bunks. And it was very difficult to be the daughter of, sure. um, especially for my sister, who was three years old, and Naomi. Anyhow, so I was brought up in the camp business. So from a young child. A young childhood. That's how we spent our summers. If it wasn't at their camp, it was at another. And later, I became a madricha at Masad, the first Hebrew-speaking camp. Masad was Hebrew-speaking the day-to-day -day interaction it, with absolutely. all Absolutely. I found, I'm always keeping things, I found the book for sports. I was the archery counselor and the tennis counselor, and we didn't have words for all of these things. And I have a glossary of what you call the bat and the glove and the base, and you know, but who can remember when you're yelling, <laughs> hit the base, you know? <laughs> so it was an exciting period because we, as counselors, had to use the Hebrew words that were being made up for us. I don't know. Somebody yeah. said pick up the phone. <clears throat> you, did you right. cut off? Someone will check it for us. Okay. Huh. I didn't turn it off, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. You can, you Go can ahead. Oh, where were we? We were in summer camps. We were growing summer up in summer camps. Um, can you hear all right? Perfect. Okay. Um, what I wanted to say was during the day there was this concentration on Zionist activity, either as a, a madricha or as a chanicha myself. And we were all busy with our Zionist activities. We met only on Friday nights at home. That was. Uh, supper, and we always had supper together, and that's where we caught up on the family the whole week, everybody doing his own thing. So some ca summer camps in that time focused in on training people to go to Israel. Was Masada There was no Israel. Like Every time anybody says Israel and they're talking right, about right. 19, forget it. This is what is so difficult for young people who were born into a state to realize sure. that there never was a state. There was a yearning. There was a dream. Were they preparing people to head off there? They were preparing Hasharot for living and building and developing Eretz Yisrael. What were those preparations like? I don't know. I didn't go to Hachshara. Are you? Yeah, my sister did because she ran them. She's the big organizer like my father. Nomi is older than you are? Yeah, older, three years older. Okay. And when I uh, headed off um, for, uh, well, we have to go back a little. How did I get there? But we won't talk about that. I, I at, ho at home, uh, I was the one who got the Hebrew education, and she did the organizing, like the Zionist youth movements and the Zionist, um, uh, the, uh, um, they had uh, youth commissions. She headed these things. 
Now, did your parents ever visit Palestine? No. After I was here, they came for the first um, mitzad, the first parade, which was a disaster. It never came off. Oh. Uh, you, it was uh, it was canceled. I know I'm hopping around. It's totally fine. We're focused in on a very specific time period. <coughs> so, so lead me continue. back to where you want to be. I want to talk about Nomi a little bit. I want to get to the point where you head off to Israel, but I'm curious about Nomi and not Nomi. Nomi, you have to know, Naomi, not Nomi, Nomi, Naomi. was a character in the sense that uh, we always had to be sent, as I said, my father, let's say, was sent to Canada to set up the, you know, we always went to school together until I went to the yeshiva and she went to a public school. And Naomi would stand in front of the mirror at the age of eight, nine, ten, I don't remember, for an hour putting on this scarf or that scarf and the other and you couldn't move her. She was beautiful and she knew it. <laughs> and uh, there she was. And I would get late to school. And this beauty directed our relationship all the way. She attracted all the young men, brought them home, and then I had to deal with them, get rid of that one or <laughs> find out more about this one. So it was a, a, a love-hate relationship, but very close. Okay, Naomi. Now tell me how you ended up heading towards Israel. My father was in the know about anything that was going on in the Jewish education field. And he heard uh, that there, the Zionist Organization of America had a one-year scholarship, was offering a one-year scholarship, mostly to find people to fill up the possibilities of visas to the Hebrew University. And so all our chevr from uh, Plugat Aliyah, which was the youth movement uh, I was most associated with, this was the general Zionist organization. I should go back. It started with Masada when we were still in college. And uh, we marched in, uh, in uh, Washington against this or that, who remembers whatever it was. I mean, we were very, we were the activists of that period. Then each one began uh, their own uh, individual uh, life, but we kept very close. And we were called Plugat Aliyah, the Zionist Organization of America's youth movement, without the Hachshara. Some of our people did go on Hachshara. Um, just to get a feel of what it might be like to live in a um, agricultural settlement, which they eventually did. They went okay. to Ginnagar. Um, but I wasn't one of those because at that time, we're talking 1947. I got a date right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had uh, graduated from Hunter as a journalism major. And uh, I was um, immediately um, scooped up to work for the uh, Jewish Welfare Board, which is today the Jewish Community Center Movement. Okay. And they had two things going. They were setting up for the first time not what the YMA, YMCAs had, they wanted to set up YMHAs. That was the Jewish Welfare on the one hand. On the other hand, they were the representative for the American government chaplaincy service. So all chaplains and all educational material that chaplains used were put out by the JWB. What were you doing for them specifically? I headed the, uh, straight from college, I was taken on to head the publications department. Uh, head, I wasn't. I was taken on to assist, and the guy dropped dead about two weeks later, the head. And I kept putting out this terrific material, and at some point they asked who's doing it. And um, it was connected with the Jewish Book Council, which then had its office there. And um, I remember Rabbi Philip Goodman was the, uh, uh, was the main person. He's passed away, but he eventually did come to Israel. And uh, he, would, um, uh, he was my mentor there. And so they took this young, inexperienced person, and they let me run the show. And at this moment in my life, my father comes up with the announcement, or rather he didn't even tell me. He submitted an essay I wrote on why a Jewish state to the uh, scholarship committee who were to decide on um, people who would get the scholarships uh, to come to the Hebrew University for three things, a year of study free, a valid visa for a year, which was an impossibility to get, and the opportunity to see what it was like to be in Eretz Israel and not at a Zionist meeting in New York. And so when I was invited to uh, be interviewed by the uh, committee, I had no idea, you know, what it, it was the last thing in my mind that I would be accepted. And I 
as I said, I, was, I won the scholarship, along with two others. One uh, was Carmi Charney, again, a Borough Park boy whose father was a rabbi, who eventually became one of our leading, uh, Tet Carmi, was a leading playwright and uh, Hebrew um, uh, uh, publicist and, and uh, publisher for Amalved. He worked many years. He knew Hebrew best of all of us. Uh, we all knew Hebrew better than most of the others. And the third one was the scene of Petach Tikva, Stampfer, this uh, Yudha Stampfer, um, who is also no longer alive. So the three of us had to board a boat within two weeks, or rather accept and go or not, and that's how it started. Were you excited? I don't know. I never get to the thing of getting um, excited or this before anything. I, I, I manage very well through it. I may collapse afterward, like wars <laughs> and things. I don't uh, fluster, and that's eventually why I decided to do first aid. I don't fluster when I'm called upon to stand up to it, you know? But afterwards, I think, idiot, what did you do? Why did you do that? You know, that's how it... Uh... What kind of preparations had to be done before you left? I had to, first of all, wind up my job pass it on to whoever. And then there were these parties. Everybody was so thrilled. Somebody's going to Eretz Israel, and, I'm so, and uh, they give me a... <laughs> I had occasion to clean the library the other day, and there was the farewell book with everybody doing a page and writing little poems, and Zippy, who conquers hearts in three languages, is now <laughs> off to Israel, you know? And all the boyfriends I had to say. I was very popular, keeping everybody at a distance. Uh, and there were all my Zionist activities. I had just been elected a month before to head a Zionist district of young professionals. So I had to find someone to replace me, and they never came to Israel, incidentally. Um, and um, I had a million things to do. And as I said to you before, <laughs> I had to buy shoes. <laughs> no shoes in this. In, uh, they have peasant white feet in, in Israel. Everybody was an Eve with. <laughs> I have this noble foot from America. Uh, in short, I had a million things to do, and so I wasn't excited about, you know, what will be. I decided, I did the Koshvim, and I'm going to find out what are you, I can always come back, and, but knowing all my friends were there, and they were, the first ship had come already with the uh, Bulgatariya people to the Hebrew University, and they were already in Ginnagar. And they had received also a ZOA scholarship, or they no, gone on their own they initiative? No, they went to... Uh, I don't know. They must have gotten, of course, they wouldn't have gotten uh, visas otherwise. They got visas, but they didn't intend to go at all to the university. They went straight to the kibbutz. And then, for registration, they came back to Jerusalem. And some of them were still there with me during the siege of Jerusalem when things started. Um, what boat? What was the name of the boat? Ah, the... Um it's okay. <laughs> I was warned. I was warned. No, no. Um, there's no question that I will tell you because <laughs> it's a very... I was 17 days at sea on a reconditioned army troop ship, which was called the Marine Jumper. I don't know what they reconditioned. It was one slab of gray, not a chair, not a, a cushion, uh, not, a, not anything, except we were a group of about 60, which included um, several Zionists uh, from the youth groups, about 50... Uh, GIs who had been accepted under the Veterans Administration to study at the Hebrew University. Which is what Dove had opened no, the door no, for. No, 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 no. That's in Jerusalem. I'm talking about uh, Professor Tartico. They sent the instructors to teach us already on the boat. Really? Professor Tartikover and two or three others accompanied us. On the same boat, on the other side of the, what do you call the deck? was a group of Americans of Lebanese origin heading for the University of Beirut. Now, we were all very chummy. I showed you in the album the pictures of all of us. There was Eddie the Arab who had a crush on me. He <laughs> followed me around everywhere I went, and my Hebrew were very annoyed. So we taught each other Hebrew. I taught him a Hebrew song on Nuban, Nuarza, and he did in Tebanta. I don't remember the song. Whatever it is, when we got to Beirut, we all swore. We were all very friendly with this group. We had our lectures, they had their lectures at the other side of the ramp, and in the evening or in the afternoon, or whenever. We even stayed up all night there because you couldn't sleep in the, uh, what do you call, deck underneath was so, the bunks were so full of um, uh, crying uh, children. They were, it was summer, 
uh, they were going back to uh, families who had, had children returning to all kinds of Arab countries. The first stop was Beirut, and that was the first introduction to selection. Everybody was allowed to disembark except the Jews headed for the Hebrew University. So the boat stopped So we in saw Beirut. the boat, and we saw Beirut the first time and last time I've ever seen Beirut. They told us it was beautiful inland, but we never saw it. And then the boat continued from Beirut. The boat continued on to Haifa. Nobody went by air in those days, not commercial airlines. 17 days of this. And um, as I said, we were very close, these two student groups. We had a lot in common. Two things we didn't talk about, politics or religion. And there's enough to talk about, young people. Sure. There we are. Do you we hit Haifa at 9 o'clock at night and also couldn't disembark because, of course, we're talking about don't use the word Israel yet. We're talking about Palestine, which was a British mandatory um, uh, government, and you had to be inspected uh, by the customs house. The customs house doesn't know sign in the morning, because the British are very British, and that's the way they do it. So we stood all night on the deck watching the lights of Haifa and just mouths open and not able to appreciate. Uh, now I'll ask you one of, one of your that. interview questions. Do you remember what you expected, what your expectations were on coming I in? never do that. I don't expect. I deal with. That's what I love about this country. It's a challenge. Whatever I have to deal with, it's a personal one. You're coming today. Am I going to be okay? Don't trip over anything before she comes. <laughs> I mean, I deal with situations, and that's how I survive. And I try not to look too far back, but I'm fortunate that I'm able to recapture That's a lot of what happened because of something I did from the very beginning, which was to write letters home. What time are we on? 26. We're going to keep going on this okay. page. And they became um, the focus of a lot of my activity to this very day. So before we touch on the letters, I want to talk about the goodbyes that you had with your parents yeah, and Yeah, there were the parties the at Jada. Will you be? And uh, I don't know. I don't remember. A lot of parties and a lot of shopping. And a lot of uh, saying goodbye and trying to remember things to do. And the clothing. Of course, there my sister was the thing. She went out and bought me a white wool suit. I shall never forget because the pictures I'm taking at the uh, pier, 83 if I'm not mistaken, or 84 uh, in New York that we had to uh, be at. Um, there I was in this Mediterranean cruise outfit, which I never wore again because I left her to do all the shopping for me. She was always very good at that. I only said, no, I won't wear that, you know. <laughs> um, and um, I don't remember. It was such a crazy two weeks. I think it was two weeks. I was interviewed in, in August, and I had to leave, uh, except by the end of August. No, it was about two or three weeks when all of this, leave my job, uh, leave my family, take care of things that I had to do. So you arrived in Palestine September right. of 47. September 13th. September 13th of 1947. And um, the Hebrew University was very excited about this contingent, and they sent a special bus. Now, in my entire days of living in New York and, and studying at Hunter College, nobody ever sent a, a bus across town to 86th Street to pick me up. <laughs> you know, it was very exciting. And I sat behind the driver the whole way, and like every good egged driver, he was describing, and there is this, and there is Tel Aviv, and there's my head like a ping pong ball. Mm -hmm. And of course, all I saw were the trees and the thing, but I knew they were there, really, things that I had grown up knowing about uh, places. And um, the very, f as I say, I, I had no family here. I didn't know uh, the people on the boat well enough to, well, I'm always friendly, but I wasn't going to share my innermost thoughts with any of them. And so I started this correspondence of letters home. And therefore, I'm able to capture those feelings and those events as they happened. At the time, did on. you know that your parents and your sister were saving the letters? No. Uh, I knew my sister was very involved because, as I say, we were very close, and she admonished me, you send me every little thing. And that's how all of the memorabilia, like the, even the bus tickets to Hebron and the opening of the university, every single thing, uh, the laundry list with all the words spelled shits instead of sheets, you know, all kinds of crazy um, English um, in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. I was going to say Israel myself, in Jerusalem at that time. 
very British, and it was a whole new thing because there was a curfew, very much like the curfew we put up for the uh, Arabs in Gaza. There was a curfew, and you couldn't be on the road after 6 p.m. So we had been at the customs house from 9 in the morning. Um, they went through every single thing. Our Hevra at um, Ginnegar sent us letters. I remember David Makarov's letter with, please bring. First of all, they can't stand the public showers. Bring a shower curtain for the kibbutz, you understand. Um, a bottle, smuggle it. We don't care how it gets. A bottle of Coca-Cola. <laughs> Wrap it in towels in your underwear or something. We need to see a bottle of Coca-Cola. They were pining for Americana. Uh, they wanted Band-Aids. Nobody ever heard of a Band-Aid uh, then. Uh, the girls were asking for um, sanitary na uh, napkins. I mean, these were things, and one guy said, don't come without toilet paper. I mean, <laughs> the things they asked for, and of course some of them we brought and some, and then I couldn't even deliver them because we couldn't leave Jerusalem for months. Okay. When you got to Jerusalem, you decided to settle away from a lot of the Americans. Well, I was trying very hard not to get involved with the English-speaking Americans. There was, uh, the university assigned us to Pension Pax, uh, which later became the home for the blind in Jerusalem. Uh, when, when I was asked where did I live, that's where they billeted us. But from my uh, window, I saw there was a without a street, just a building rising out in near Givat Shaul, the first three-story building in that area, which was very exciting. So I went um, on a little uh, run, uh, re reconnaissance trip, and I discovered that's where the local boys and girls are staying, going to the Hebrew University, not the Americans. And um, I discovered there was a room on the third floor on the top where there was only one girl living, a British girl, and I persuaded her to accept me as a roommate. And I quickly rounded up all my chevra, and they moved me in, coup d'etat. And I'm going to tell the university about it tomorrow. First, and also there, you're not supposed to cook, but you could have a little um, hot plate. So it, I, was, I was making my arrangements convenient to me. And it had huge veranda out onto the, uh, it, it, and as I said, it had no street. Uh, maybe two or three weeks later, I write this letter to my sister with some pictures. We now have a street called Rechov Borowski because the <laughs> winter was upon us, and I got everybody to take one or two, in a, in, spend an hour, each one takes a stone, and we make a path so we don't have to step in all this mud and and le uh, fazer In other words, we had a street named after the family. <laughs> so that's what I always did. I took over wherever I could to organize other people. That's a family uh, trait. <laughs> Wonderful. So when you say, what did you think? Oh, well, I don't know. I wasn't thinking. I was just doing and feeling and responding to the needs of the hour, whatever they were. Wonderful. And that's how I live in Israel all my life here. Great. We're going to switch tapes, and we're going to continue in a minute. Um, one of the things you talked about were these letters. Maybe you can explain a little more. Yes. Um, we talk about letters because what we're talking about is an air letter, the uh, Palestine government uh, air letter. This is what it looked like. When it was closed, you had the address in the front and your address in the back, which says, Pension Pax, Neumann de Führer, Jerusalem, Rechavia. Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then if you wrote by hand, you could write a, it up a whole page, page okay. and another half a page. Now, I, I, I noticed that I, this is in red ink. I was in such a hurry, I never bought a black ribbon for my Olivetti or whatever. Ah, I have to tell you about why are these letters uh, all about the same size, because that was the size that you could get in on this air letter. And um, I would... Um, um, Right, if I needed, I wrote two of them. There was no paper available, a pad of paper. Nobody had a pad of paper. The, uh, the Israel uh, paper mills were founded until uh, 25, 30 years state. I'm exaggerating. Anyhow, this was a very important thing, this letter, okay? How many letters did you write home? Well, um, it's very difficult for me to say. I picked out from the letters that I wrote about 100, so there must have been uh, at least three times as many. I didn't write, use all of them. 
uh, because sometimes I wrote twice a day, so I would take from the same day, and that's the only editing uh, I did of the book. So most, most of your story or your experiences from 47 and 48... I found it very important as a personal mission to share with my Zionist family in America everything I was experiencing, uh, what I thought, what I saw, what I felt. I was a journalism major. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, at a certain moment in time, the uh, 29th of November when we get there, that's when I started realizing I'm a foreign correspondent. And my letters, which were previously about a tiul, uh, a, a trip here, getting to know. We couldn't leave the Jerusalem area uh, because there was no um, leaving the city. Uh, it was still tense at that time. I couldn't even visit my friends in Ginnegar until uh, after the... Uh, uh, breakthrough to the, from Jerusalem. In short, uh, I did a lot of teeling because the young people who were in my building were the uh, Yeshuv, the Palestinians of Jewish descent were called the Yeshuv. Okay? So these, we were all, anybody who was there was a Palestinian. It's hard for you to realize. Um, and they had just returned from fighting uh, in the Allied forces in the Second World War. And they were resuming their studies. How did they interact? What was the relationship like with American students? Very suspicious. Now, I told you about this. I'm in the building, and there's this English girl who keeps to herself. Nobody even knows she exists. She has one or two friends. She goes to concerts. We go out together. I'm mothering her. She's about uh, two or three years younger. And then we turned out that her father and my father She's from England, knew each other from young, international Young Judea conferences, and I was sort of taking care. And I would, uh, maybe the first Shabbat I was there, I went out on this huge veranda, take a book, and sit in the sun. You know, beautiful. I wasn't there five minutes when everybody else came out with a book or a chair. And they, I don't know, I didn't manage to say two words, and they already figured out from my American accent that I was English. Now, you must know they were very suspicious of um, English-speaking people. And they had no exposure to Z Jewish Zionists from America. And I began to get this um, resenting. What did you come for? You know, this is our thing. Why are you here? What are you doing here? Why don't you know? I mean, what do you mean, what am I doing here? This is my country as much as yours. It's my Eretz Israel. We are Zionists. They couldn't get it. Uh, and, and I found... Uh, well, what can I tell you? Every time I think of it, I remember the letter I wrote home at that time explaining to my family that they don't even realize that there are Zionists in America. They can't think beyond their experience in the war or their Holocaust backgrounds of their parents or the British situation now. It seems that your circle of friends widened to include Israel. I was very close with the Americans that I came with. We were a family. But like with every family, you branch out. So I left that family and moved on to making new friends. And that's how I got involved uh, in um, actually the Haganah as well, because these guys lived like monks. We had in our rooms uh, a bulb. We had in our rooms an iron bedstead with a, a, a straw mattress. We had no closets, but everything what we had a lot of in Israel, in, in Palestine at that time, was uh, uh, orchards. So there were crates. Two crates to the side was a bookcase. Uh, six crates across was a desk. Everything was crates. And this, we arrived, we American girls, there were about five of us actually who were very close in the Zionist group and who later joined the Haganah together. We had irons and hair dryers and alarm clocks. I mean, what American girl leaves uh, without uh, taking the necessary things you need <laughs> and electrical appliances? I can't tell you how many shirts I ironed or how many. And they were grateful. They would come up with posies. We were all very close friends. We were a new phenomena. And then there was this guy, Yudo, who wanted to learn English. So he would bring... Um, um, I would have to take out my, my English books and read the New Yorker or what magazines and read, and he would read the Bible, and so I would get a Bible course, and we were excited. And then there was Ami, who was a, a zoologist. They were all, I had no idea that these guys were living a double life until my alarm clock made the difference. Because Ami, who was the head of the unit, um, 
would um, uh, borrow my alarm clock in order for us to get back. We were, we were studying at that time a little bit at the Hebrew University. They made special arrangements because of the American veterans that they should be able to uh, report that they were um, um, studying at the, um, studying. Uh, but Ami needed the alarm clock because they would set up clandestine meetings for the Haganah, Palmach, or whatever unit they were in. And then they would rush back and be home by five in the morning and uh, return the alarm clock and we would get to classes on time. I never knew what they were doing. But apparently, somewhere along the line, they got the impression that we were not just um, uh, silly American girls, because we did giggle a lot. There was a lot going on. And like in MASH, you remember the, uh, the, um, the uh, television show where these surgeons are cutting up people, and they're laughing and joking. It was a way to let off tension. And we giggled a lot. Do you remember being inducted into the Haganah when that was? Well, that was a, a really weird one because uh, everybody hung out. When you got to town, you hung out in this cafe or that cafe. And there I was sitting and minding my own business when someone I didn't know approached me and said, um, are you ready to defend Jerusalem? So impulsively I asked, of course. And then he sends me to another guy who I didn't know and a third guy, and eventually I was led to a basement in the Rechavia High School where there was an induction ceremony. And what was it? Um, three guys whose faces I never saw behind a, a table with a Jewish flag draped on it and no lights, everything dimmed, and they're inter interrogating me and the two or three friends who uh, were lined up here. And um, why did you come and why are you staying? Because nobody in their right mind was hanging around. Jerusalem was a very uh, difficult, um, unsettling uh, period at that time. And uh, we must have passed muster because at some moment they confronted us in one hand with a Bible and in the other hand with a pistol and gave us an oath of allegiance. Well, I had no idea what I committed myself to undertake until maybe 50 years later in the Haganah Museum in Tel Aviv. There on the wall was the Oath of Allegiance. I hereby undertake all the days of my life to defend the Jewish people. I knew I was, I had no idea what I signed up for. I've been doing that all my life. But had I known then, I'm not so sure I would have signed up for all that. <laughs> Lay your life on the line every moment. What sort of things did Haganah have you doing? Oh, that was fun. That was not fun. Um, as you see, I'm well endowed. And so we girls who were never searched, the British were very gentlemanly, they never searched girls, we carried the hand grenades under our shirts, loose shirts, bound around us, and I had to accompany, my first assignment, in fact, was to accompany a Haganah boy, who, if he was found, with, um, uh, with any kind of uh, Neshek armaments, uh, the penalty of death. So we were very important as uh, messengers and carriers, and that's how uh, uh, they found. Well, I didn't like the idea of being blown up in that good, because the minute they were shooting, you were dropping. Now, who knows, does a pin go off when I drop? They sent us for 10 days of a training camp, which was really, <laughs> I'm giggling because it was such fun. First of all, we thought we were in a summer camp, you know, dressed in the baggiest, uh, they gave us stones to throw instead of, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, hand grenades. And we, who came from America, the armies and training, <laughs> what is this hobo army, you know, I mean, what are we doing here? And then uh, one of our uh, friends uh, was supposed to, we were organized into two teams like they have in the movies, you know, the red team and the blue team. And the, the signal was, um, uh, what is this, uh, tanim, yelilat tanim, what do you call it, a jackal. A jackal, was on, and some jackal happened to, <laughs> to crow at that hour, or whatever a jackal does, and loused up, we lost the thing. But it, it was great 10 days of that. And then we were seasoned gunmen. Did you have a camera. sense that you were part of something so big? Oh, yes, big? I knew that from the minute I arrived. When I got off the boat, and there were these, um, uh, what do you, dismantle a boat? You don't say dismantle, you un take stuff off a boat is a word. And it was a relay Sol Sol from Solinica, uh, Solinikayim, you know, with shorts, grubby, 
uh, shouting in Hebrew, passing the luggage one to the other, refrigerators, everything. There were no uh, uh, forks and no lifters. Everything was done by hand, like a, a car, and singing and shouting in Hebrew. I mean, this was just a whole new way of life and a whole new breed. And then in Jerusalem, these boys were nothing like any of the uh, guys I went out with in New York. I mean, uh, they had been in the army. They were returned soldiers. And they were so dedicated and so grim. I mean, I don't think ever saw a smile on anybody's face. The whole thing was so grim. So we giggled a lot. I mean, what are they taking this so sad? So, so, you know, we did it. Then I got busy organizing because once they were giving me assignments I didn't like, I decided I'm going to make one I'm going to ready to do. And I learned about a first aid course. And I this is after the partition plan? This is we're after talking, I should have said that everything changed on the 29th of November. Up to that period, I was uh, going on tours, making friends. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, one of the, uh, the head of the student uh, union. He was very close, and he, re he realized what a potential we American Zionist girls could be. What was his name? <laughs> oh, dead. <laughs> and uh, he was something special. And he went out of his way to take us on Tiulim, to Hebron, and he took us to Gush Etzion, which later, having been there, I knew exactly who was there and how it happened. And I would write letters describing, as if I were a journalist on a mission, uh, those first letters don't even tell anything about um, sure. the war, because what I'm doing is describing as I would write an article and send it home. And I was hoping my father would do something with it, because I knew he was always busy passing my letters around to uh, everybody. So let's walk back a little bit to, to the partition plan, to November 29th. Yes. Do you remember sitting around radio? Where, where no, no, were no, you? I can't forget what happened on the <laughs> no, November 29th, because you have to know that that was the mocking uh, point in, uh, in all of our uh, activities there. Um, you find a letter for us. Yes, I will. Uh, but first, I'm finding a map. You should know, and I am so proud of the book, because it was written not just for people who lived through that period, the people who wish they had, and the people who need to know sure. what was. This is the partition plan. Amen. Everything in... No. Okay. Everything in uh, orange was the Jewish state, the proposed Jewish state. Everything in green was the proposed Arab state. Please notice the difference in size, very little. There was 5,500 square meters, a proposed Jewish state, 4,500 a proposed Arab state, and about 289 square meters an uh, international enclave for Jerusalem. They could have had the Arabs that state on a silver platter if they had not turned around, invaded, and started a war. They had it. Okay, and what happens? We, who heard that the United Nations is going to make an announcement, nobody really believed. In our day, the UN was a place where you deliberated and deliberated. They never did anything. They talked a lot. And suddenly, I had arrived here, I should have said, uh, when the British were fed up and they had passed on the problem of the partition of Palestine to a United Nations committee in UNSCOPE, who were deliberating. But to everybody's amazement, on the 20. 9th of November, 1947, they came to a conclusion with their deliberations and announced uh, that they were going to announce that there was going to be a vote. So, of course, we huddled around the radio, which was only a battery radio, and kept conking out, and we uh, listened to the count. It was got to be a vote. There was one, there was two, there was three, four, and finally there was 13, four, and that carried the day. And what we had was a, an approval for the partition by the United Nations for the partition of Palestine, with the understanding that the British would leave by May 14th. This was November. Uh, May 15th. They had to leave on the 14th because the 15th turned out to be a Shabbat. 
and um, we needed the matter there the day before. <laughs> um, and so for the first time, the awareness that history is in the making and I'm where it's happening hit me. And all my flippant, informative letters, they didn't stop, but the predominant mood of my letter writing then was, I'm a foreign correspondent. I'm, I'm where it's happening. I have to share this. And so on the morning of uh, November 30th, the morning after the night before, I write a letter to my family. Long, long letter. And I write, uh, Dearest Mother, Dad, and Naomi, I walked in a semi-daze through the crowds of happy faces, through the deafening singing of David Melech Yisrael, Chai, Chai, V'Kayam, past the British tanks and jeeps piled high with pyramids of flag-waving, cheering children. I dodged motorcycles and wagons and cars and trucks racing madly up and down King George Street, missing each other miraculously, running boards and headlights overflowing with layer upon layer of elated happy people. I pushed my way past the crying, kissing, tumultuous crowds and the exultant shouts of Mazal Tov and came back to the quiet of my room to share, or to try and share with you, this never-to-be-forgotten night. And then I tell them about where we were and what we did and how all night goes on for pages. But suddenly, rumor has it that Ben-Gurion has just arrived from Tel Aviv and will make a personal appearance. And sure enough, there he was, standing on the balcony of the Sochnut building, the heart of Jerusalem, looking slowly and solemnly around him to the rooftops crammed with people, to the throngs that stood solid in the courtyard below him. And he raised his hand, and utter silence waited for his words, Ashrenu shezachinu layom hazeh. Blessed are we who have been privileged to witness this day. He concluded with Tchi hamadina ha'ivrit. He called it the Hebrew state because it had no name. Blessed be the Hebrew state. And asked everyone to... Uh, sing Hatikva, Kulfat, a solemn chant rose. The moment was too big for our feelings. There were few dry eyes and few steady voices. Ben-Gurion tossed his head back proudly, had this white um, uh, uh, shock of hair, it tenderly touched the flag that hung from the railing, and charged the air with electricity when he shouted defiantly, we are a free people. I still get goose pimples when I read that because I remember the moment Something is now about to happen. The dream of 2,000 years, maybe. I mean, that's when we started imagining what might be. Well, it didn't last very long because I, um, I write how I wished I could have heard, you could have heard, I write to my family, his words, and been here for this memorable night and never-to-be-forgotten morning. It was too unbelievable. And, of course, I describe many other things. Incidentally, we spoke earlier about the... Um, the Oath of Allegiance to the Haganah. This was it that I found at the, um, at the Museum of the Haganah. What so that uh, day, uh, within two or three hours, there were already attacks on the road, the Haifa buses. So you had, there was only one road. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask, right, right after this happened, it we seems We were like even there was told a... to go home and have our private... So we have been up all night, change your clothes, have a shower... Um, to go home and have a uh, private celebration and be aware. So there, when were the repercussions? When did you start feeling the repercussions of the partition plan? Immediately. What sort of things? It, well, uh, what shall I tell you? The, um, cut for a minute, please. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Because I... Okay. No problem. Okay. Um, I want to read you, that's, I can't... What, what number are we at? What minute? Okay. Ten. Okay, thanks. You must realize that we were American kids with a different frame of reference. Even the Second World War, we set out in our universities in America. We weren't in the Army, the girls at least. Anyhow, there we are, caught up. We've already... Uh, realize that we're not leaving because this is our chance to stand up with the yeshuv. With our, they were sure at the first volley we would all take off. None, did, did people take off? Everybody took off. We were about five or six. You could count them on the hands. We're still friends today, and we're still here, except for those who passed away. I told you we had a 60th wedding anniversary of the only couple among us who was uh, married at the time. 
Anyhow, on the, December is when I started uh, with the Haganah, and it was so suburb, I didn't even write about it without a date. Later, it came in a pack of uh, letters for them. Uh, and I had to say, shh, don't tell anybody. But everything was hush-hush and secretive. Something we uh, in America are so open and free, it never occurred to us how do you deal with these clandestine things. And maybe we didn't take seriously enough uh, the, the consequences of our talking or, or, or being uh, too public about what we were doing. On December 27th, I see, I write a letter. It's so confusing to negate what you are and what you were conditioned to, and at the same time trying to be an integral part of where you are. Uh, a totally new and different set of circumstances. And I refer to Christmas Eve, for example. We all know in New York and Christmas Eve, jingle bells. Are, and here we are singing jingle bells while we're doing um, um, uh, Shmirah. We, the second thing we all did, aside from the individual uh, activities, uh, were shmirah, regarding the building we live in, because we were at the top uh, of a building. The, the wadi below would be where the Arabs would come up from Dir Yassin or Givat Shaul uh, to where we were. So we were already at an outpost. Dece and December time, were you still attending classes? We were having provisional classes. Wherever they could, they put up a, a class. I remember one of our friends was called to the American Embassy and he was asked, are you uh, studying? And he answered, we're studying as much as anybody else is studying. I mean, he couldn't tell them. We didn't want to announce. We didn't care so much about worrying about whether they were going to take away our American uh, passports because we were furious with the American government. Here is a country fighting for its independence and liberation in the face of uh, Arab invasions. And where is the American government? We're defending what you're not doing. So we, if they had called me, I would have answered that. And I wrote to my parents in America uh, because they were still worried about how will the American government feel and get those students out? And I write my mother, who was also very active in protecting. She had a letter to President Truman, get those students out of Jerusalem. I said, Mother, stop it. We don't want to get out. If we wanted to get out, back off. You sent us here as Zionists. We grew up as Zionists. This is our moment. Back off. We'll do what we can to defend. And the Americans better get in on it, too. Did your parents continue to be supportive? That's what I'm saying. There was this letter to President Truman that really upset me. It was sent by special messenger. Uh, you know, the Jews had their own kind of uh, messenger, courier. courier service. Uh, nobody got a letter uh, in November, December without special arrangements. And they were trying to use their protexia to get me out and all the students who were all uh, friends. Of, uh, the parents were all friends. And um, I remember uh, saying in, in the letter, which I can't find at this moment, this is the moment we've waited for in our history. We're here. We're part of it. Anything you do can only harm and make an issue out of it. You make an issue, they'll bring it. They'll be writing about it in the New York Times. Just buzz off from it. We'll take care of what we have to do, and I promise to keep you in the show if you don't print every letter. I mean, I'm writing you, but I'm doing it confidentially. And I'm making great efforts to get anybody who left Jerusalem took a letter in his pocket back to America and contacted my parents. You mentioned taking a first aid course at a certain point. Yeah, that uh, I heard that the local doctor was giving it. It was also clandestine. Any meeting with more than three or four people was a, a, an illegal activity, according to British. Any convention. So we had to come separately, individually, Actually, the first first aid course was in a synagogue. That rather upset me, because there we were learning how to use guns, because we even had to protect ourselves uh, as first aid people, and uh, doing the course. And the hardest part was knowing all the parts of the body in Hebrew. I knew Hebrew, but who knew all the bones and all the things? And I was afraid I would never be able to uh, <laughs> tell the doctor what was wrong. Um, but it, 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 actually, it was uh, more a question of finding a niche for me, and that seemed to be the right one, the first aid. When do you remember using your first aid? Well, I can tell you exactly when, because when we finished, we got this armband, which made us medics. And can you repeat the last sentence, please? 
I say, I can tell you exactly when it was because we, as graduates of the first aid course, got this armband. And this armband entitled us to do first aid. However, the first time that I did first aid was the bombing of Ben Yehuda Street. Now, you all have known in the last few years, it's sure. been uh, the, the uh, locale for one after the other of, of uh, uh, terrible terrorist activities. This was the first one. February 27th, 24th, 25th um, of um, um, 1948, the beginning. In other words, from December to February, I was very involved in all kinds of first aid activities and calls. I even did another nice thing that I'm proud of. Because the locals were so confused with the English-speaking girls, when we were thinking of what can we do, I said, you know, we have girls in our... Uh, uh, gang <laughs> who are Americans, who are British. The BBC, the girls from England recognize the BBC can uh, uh, monitor it. The girls from South Africa know Zulu. They can convey all kinds of messages in code. The girls from America know how to er organize things. The girls from Scotland can't be understood by anybody. The more wee, wee, wees they put into it, I'm a wee, nobody will understand what they're, but they understand. So we organized the girls into uh, various activities in the Haganah. Um, but you asked me about um, the uh, first aid. I realized um, in that, that day um, of doing first aid for the first time, I arrive at the scene of this rubble. It reminded me when 9-11 showed the pictures, digging for pieces of human flesh, digging. This is the scene I arrived at. At 6.45 in the morning, there was a huge blast. Anything in Jerusalem is heard all over the city. And um, now I'm a first aid attendant. I take my backpack, I take my armband, and I go looking for the war. But they don't let me in because of my American accent. They think I'm an English spy. And I remember standing f tall and firm and saying, can't you see that every hand is needed here? And finally, I persuaded them to let me through. And I couldn't find a first aid station to report to. So I did what I've been doing all my life in Israel. I did something resourceful. I took my lipstick, made a huge Magen David Adom on a protected uh, uh, wall, uh, entranceway, and in five minutes I was in business. Everybody knew what that meant. So I gathered children. I did what you do when you have to do. And at the end of that day, when I got back, and I'm writing it all up in my uh, candlelight, uh, because I had to bring home with me a woman who was hung on to me the whole time. I, we knew no, we had no language in common. I still don't know if it was Romanian or whatever. She was a, a Holocaust survivor. She had just been placed in a room there, and now she'd been blown out of it in smithering. She knew nobody. I knew not where to direct her. And I bandaged her, and she was obviously in shock. And I knew a little um, uh, French. She knew a little German. We just words and hands. But she realized I'm her savior, whatever. Well, I'm going to leave the scene and go home and leave her there? She hung on to me. I smuggled her into the room. I gave her my bed. I treated her a cup of tea. And it's like the world had changed for her because of that. And I did my writing that night by candle night. I wasn't going to give up, and I wrote by hand. Are there words to describe senseless human tragedy? Will I? Can I ever forget this day? I'm becoming like the Jews who live here. Every shock and sorrow nurtures them to grim restraint and fierce dedication. And from that moment on, all my letters were not they referring to the Yeshuv and the boys, uh, the Palestinian Jews, but we. That was my moment of identification. At, what, at some point, Jerusalem comes under siege. How did that affect well, your day Well, it wasn't day -day under living? some point. It was just that's what was happening. The, the Arabs were determined um, to starve us into submission to isolate Jerusalem. It had no um, uh, uh, resources, no water supplies. Everything that came to us came via the road of Tel Aviv, which uh, was an ambush uh, country. 
the Arabs would sit on the mountain and just uh, um, drop uh, down and, and attack the convoys. We began to go in convoys, two or three or four or five or however, and my fellow students from the university, they were the protectors of the convoys. They were the palmachniks. So we all kept in touch. And I, any time uh, that uh, any of uh, the people from my Haganah unit went out, I said, if you hear English, get a name. So I sort of knew where everybody was. Um, but, um, sorry, what did you ask me just now about? Life under siege. Uh, it's very difficult. I remember some reporter in America said, and what did you do between, you know, life and... I said, we tried to stay alive. What can I tell you? Wherever you were needed, you did. I have no recollection of the, the moment. There was the treating. There was a being in and out. Uh, whatever they sent me, I went. And after Ben Yehuda, I became a kind of a celebrity because they discovered I could set up a, uh, infirmary services without waiting for somebody to tell me what to do. Just using your lipstick. Using my lipstick and my initiative. And that's how eventually I got to uh, the Arab village of Dir Yassin and uh, was there uh, during the major. The you asked me about the siege, and that's what I wanted to get back to. Slowly, slowly things got worse and worse. Uh, we were trying to f figure out how to stay alive. That's about the nearest to it. You learn to duck. You learn to um, keep your first aid kit with you. There wasn't even place to bury the number of people who died in the streets. People were still coming from America. I remember my boss from JWB pitched up. And he was asked to use me as a uh, uh, liaison. He wanted to set up a YMHA. This was earlier on in March, April. He wanted to set up a YMHA in the middle of all this excitement. But nobody told him that in order to do that, he'd have to stay alive. <laughs> so he found out that Zippy, who had once worked for him, was here. I mean, he knew me from then. And he, I became his kind of liaison. I made appointments for him to meet the people in the government in order to set up the first um, Jewish community center in Jerusalem. And I remember um, I giggled an awful lot because he had no comprehension of why they needed two um, restaurants or two swimming pools or why they needed uh, chlorine. He didn't understand that they had to. I mean, it, it, it was a whole new way of life. And I, being the liaison, I had, to, and I had to keep him alive. I would push him into a doorway when they started. He didn't realize he had a duck, you know. And he comes back home and calls my mother up, and he says, I don't know what they taught her at the university, but she's learned how to live in, in, in difficult circumstances, nothing you could learn except in wartime in Jerusalem. Was there ever a moment that you considered going back to New York? Not really. I, I really thought, this is it. I mean, my whole life I've been a Zion. What's it all about if not this moment? I might have had that decision a year after had there been no war. And I would have thought, whatever, well. But... Under those circumstances, on the contrary, how do I stay? How do I get my American family to back off trying to get me out officially? And the rest of us. Uh, there's a lot of social, there's a lot of friends mentioned in We're the We're close. We're like an extended family. Uh, we talked about uh, the, uh, the Tiulim. I made one Tiul to the um, Gush Etzion area, which subsequently, there was a terrible massacre there. And in the group was Oded, my friend, and um, uh, Moshe Perlstein, who was um, from the uh, Hebrew University group, who had uh, been a very close friend. His sister and my sister uh, were very close friends. So, and I read that he was killed. So I'm rushing around to the foreign correspondents to make sure that his family knows before uh, th that's what I did. I did all these things uh, because I knew the journalists and my friends worked at the, at the Jerusalem Post. They were all uh, underground um, uh, activities at the Jerusalem Post as well. You actually mentioned two friends who worked yes, at the uh, Post. Yes, Morty uh, Dovbenaba. He was a, um, a Harvard graduate uh, Arab studies and uh, had lived in Egypt and served in the American Air Force in some... Um, intelligence activity there. So he was now an editor at the Post, and so was Morty Chertov, which is son of a rabbi, who uh, had been with me on November 29th 
the night that we did this uh, all night, uh, he, the four of us, uh, another guy, uh, Noam, who took the pictures. The point is that uh, we, um, we knew we were in a very special time in a very special place. And we made the, mess, the best we could of every moment of it. Great. We're going to switch tapes for a minute, and we're going to keep going. Okay. I got off the track. Say when. Okay. All right, we were talking a bit about culture shock. Yeah, I must tell you, this business of a few days after, I've been in, in Palestine a couple of days in the student quarters, and I don't know how people get a hot bath here. I heard about it. And they told me that in the bathtub, I hadn't noticed, there's a huge tank, and on the bottom it has one of these things like a fireplace. And I was a Girl Scout, and you have to take twigs and make a fire and wait 20 minutes for the water to boil, and I, I, I got it straight from, don't leave the bathroom, that's the most important thing, because you're warming the water, somebody else is going to come in and use it. And after that, I'm writing these flippin' funny letters to my sister, can you believe it? From the sweat of my own brow, I made a fire, I had a hot bath, I don't know when I'll have the energy to do another <laughs> one, but I have to. and then the language. Um, Two or three of us, as I say, knew Hebrew, and they wouldn't dare going into a restaurant without taking one of us with us. We had no idea what we were eating. And I write my sister, everything is either filling, foreign, or fattening. <laughs> I have no idea. And then I would do the ordering, and I would say, Ani chafetza, which is biblical Hebrew for I would like. Instead, they discovered here it's anirotsa. So I had to learn the whole new language, but I was very much in demand to be the translator. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing was the recognizing of an entirely different breed of Jew than I had been familiar with in our Zionist circles. And it was just um, um, a new way of life. Everything was new. How do you flush a toilet? How do you put on a light when you go in a building? Things that Nobody ever told us when we came on Aliyah, as they say. So that was the adjustment. And remembering that you mustn't flash around your Americanism. I was always wore the same khaki skirt and uh, blouse. Uh, Israeli, uh, the Palestinian girls wore socks. Nobody had stockings. Uh, bulky shoes, which I couldn't find. And hand-embroidered blouses, beautiful. I died for one of them until I got a friend who made one for me. Um, it was a different cultural, but we were very, I don't know about the others, I was very sensitive. I had this closet full of American dresses, and I didn't dare wear them. I didn't want to stand out. I cut them up for handkerchiefs later. <laughs> <laughs> they were cotton. <laughs> Did you have any interaction? Online. Um, I'm flashing back a little to the letter writing bit, because after these... Are we on? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Um, after the um, uh, the arrival was very important for me, as I said, to share whatever I, I was experiencing, and it was a whole new way of life. And I described, like a journalist, what I saw, what I felt, what the people around me were feeling, and I wrote these informative, flippant letters until the 29th of November, and I told you that I became history was in the making. And the tension after that started to mount. You could cut it with a knife. It was so clear that the Arabs were determined uh, to um, uh, isolate Jerusalem. And that's where the siege of Jerusalem comes in shortly. And to, um, uh, well, I would say starve us into submission. There was no way to find food. During that terrible period of the siege, terrible in the sense that nobody knew we were alive or dead, no contact with our families. Um, nothing I could do but keep writing letters. Weird, knowing they were not going anywhere. Very much like putting letter in a bottle when you're on a desert island and tossing it out to sea, hoping somewhere, somewhere we'll find it and, and know that there was an American girl here at that time. Anyhow, we were blithely unaware uh, with this Haganah bit that um, all of our fellow students were leading a double life because they were training for an underground army to be, for a state to be. So it was dead serious stuff, and that's why I said earlier that our flippancy disturbed them, but that's the way we handled, uh, I would say, uh, the tensions.
because it was very tense and it was all very difficult for us. We mentioned the Ben Yehuda bombings, but that wasn't the only one. That wasn't the only one. There was a series of uh, three or four. There was the uh, uh, Palestine Post Building. There was the Hadassah Convoy. There was the Gush Etzion, one after the other, and no respite. And with humor, they used to say that the whole thing is being organized by the people who, uh, the glaciers, so that they can uh, get uh, jobs to put new glasses. New gl I mean, they're the, they're the cause of all this. You know, you heard a bomb, oh, where? And we used to um, sit around huddled in our student quarter at the beginning, before we were actively, because we had guarded our building. But when there was this um, shooting, you didn't know if it was ours or theirs. Uh, if it was one big Zets, it was us. It was indiscriminate. It was uh, the uh, Arabs. And you had to... Everything is, is, um, uh, resounds in Jerusalem, so you had no idea where the shooting was coming from. It was very, very, very disconcerting. And that's where we got trained to take whatever comes day by day. And then we were very close. We would be huddled in one room together, each of us reporting what we did and sharing our food. And uh, we were lucky that one of the girls uh, had been a, a, in the American Army a whack. Uh, the Amer Women's American Army, she'd been a dietitian. What was her name? Aliza. And she later settled in Kibbutz Ayarat Shacha. And um, Aliza's uh, father was a professor at the um, uh, Theological Seminary in Numa. We were all interwoven. Our families knew each other. We knew each other. And um, I'd never known them before, but we became like sisters. And she was my roommate most of the way, except when I moved out. The point is, Aliza um, had a terrible uh, Brooklyn accent. When we used to go on these teal limb, she'd just open her mouth and say, Afo hakar tisim, and everybody <laughs> shut up on the, oh, there's American girls on the bus, you know, to a full or whatever. And that's how we went uh, tealing a great deal, but we couldn't leave Jerusalem. There was no access to the old city. That's exactly where we couldn't go until after the liberation, which we celebrated not a, a week ago. So did you have any interactions with the old city? or was No, something put except how to get through. Now, when I was in Dir Yassin, that was also, um, I was assigned to set up a, uh, a uh, infirmary there. With what? We had to go through the Arab houses. They assigned two soldiers to accompany me. They were still clearing out the bodies from the terrible events that had happened there. The Haganah took over, and I was the Haganah nurse. And I would choose a bed or something, a table, something I could use. And I suddenly came across a book, um, Hardy. And I'm reading it, and I'm saying, well, I'm going to permit myself to take it. I'll return it. You know, I just, we're going, it was very disconcerting for me, that business of... What were the events that led up to Dir Yassin? Um, or even can you describe well, what Well, I can happened? only tell you they're now trying to um, analyze the history. I do remember the day that through the streets of Jerusalem, in an open truck, they carried uh, supposedly the people who had been rounded up. But what wasn't clear was that it had not been a massacre, that it, there were never that many people killed, that the women and children were the front, and the soldiers had infiltrated from the Iraqi army were... It was the same scene that now, using um, uh, the civilian population as a front. And they had been um, given notice, were about to invade the loudspeakers. They had every chance, and there was a terrible misunderstanding and a blowing up of, 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 uh, of events that did not happen. But for me, personally there, it was very, very difficult, because I'm still an American still a woman, still not a soldier enough to be completely uh, immobilized by the smells in the house that I'm whitewashing to make a, uh, the, the smell of death in the house that I've picked to whitewash. And our so soldiers with their glistening buttons flitting around carrying corpses, the laundry swinging on a line, the pots on the porch. I mean, it was just an awful lot. And there was a whole period where I couldn't write. I was completely mesmerized by it. Until after that, I did at one stage decide, I don't care if they're bombing. They were shelling from Nivy uh, Samuel the uh, 
Jerusalem was isolated. The only way was to come by uh, airplane, these small, um, what do you call the uh, first uh, planes, sorry. Um, uh, and uh, my friend um, from the youth movement, Jerry Renov, was one of the pilots who was um, bringing uh, these, and how were they doing? They were land. They made a landing strip between Dir Yassin and uh, uh, Kiryat Moshe. Where there was a landing strip. Uh, during the day, they bombarded missile, and during the night, we filled up the holes. And this became history in the Israel Air Force. My letters about that. But one day, I said I can't stand it, and I snuck out during a, a, a Hafuga when there was a ceasefire. It wasn't a ceasefire, but there was no, we knew the hours approximately when they were. And I got it back. I went back to my room to get some underwear, to get some writing paper, to get uh, mail. Maybe you somebody were sleeping left. in Deir at the time? Yeah, I was stationed there. I was assigned there. I hadn't been back to my room for maybe a month. I hadn't seen. I didn't know. I lost track of where everybody was, which was bad, because I was keeping records. And there, I'm told, is Jerry heading back to Tel Aviv, <laughs> and he can take some of my letters. Uh, that's how some of them got out. Anyhow, um, why am I telling you this? Because when I headed back, the, sh the, uh, the missiles started throwing again. And I found myself a landing. Uh, I, I, can't, I, I still have the piece of shrapnel that didn't hit me in the head. And I did a fast Shmai Israel and got down and wiggled my way back. And I get back and the sentries, idiot, what did you go for? <laughs> what did you expect? They weren't going to start when they usually start? I said, I don't know, but it was more important for me to get the mail and the underwear. Excuse me. I mean, I was never a daredevil, but I, when I had to do something, I did do it. And that's how um, that duty a sin business went on. Anyhow, um, the, the, uh, as I said, the Jewish uh, agency building, all of these terrible uh, events. And in the city, there was, what was the pre-siege? It was sniping and shooting and shelling indiscriminately. You couldn't move. And there was no let up. And food and water and fuel were critically um, missing, no supplies because the only way to get them would be by convoy, and the convoys were being um, ambushed. Anyhow, when did the Jerusalem siege start? It, actually, it was Pesach 1948, because that was the last big convoy, 200 lorries with food. And mind you, in every convoy, there would be drivers. There would be our boys who were protecting them. There would be a food that they were bringing. But Erev Pesach, they came with chickens that hadn't been ritually slaughtered. And nobody would accept them. <laughs> and the thought, I mean, there wasn't even a rabbi to say you may because you're starving. I mean, it just wasn't a thing anybody was going to do. So it was amazing, the, um, the Seder under siege that we had at that time, not knowing that that would be the last convoy to come through. And for that one, we had a ration because there was a Canadian um, member of the um, Jerusalem, uh, a lawyer, a very famous lawyer who later became the head of the uh, Bet Adin, he um, inaugurated the first ration. I mean, rationing of nothing. But let's say students. We were rationed one egg. One egg, which none of us had seen any fowl or, or, or meat or anything, vegetable, nothing. Three months was going on this uh, we're now in, uh, in April. I moved ahead a month or two. Um, it was April 5th, if I'm not mistaken, Pesach. And uh, there was, as I said, there was a wonderful spirit in the air, because you walked everywhere from check post to check post, and you could see the places that weren't shooting. You knew where the shots came from, Nebi Samuel. You looked up, looks quiet, we'll walk. Do you have and, a memory of where you had Seder? Oh, yes. It was at... Uh, my commander, who had taught me uh, all the first, uh, I was well, not the first day, but all the um, elementary uh, arms and uh, training, uh, was a guy by the name of Yuda. And um, he um, was on the uh, convoy protecting the convoy. He's a Palmachnik. In fact, um, every time he came back, he was always full of the right rumors. He'd fall asleep, dead asleep in a chair in my room. Not after he'd had a cup of tea or told me a little bit about 
what's going on and then drop dead sleep because they would without sleep days and nights. And um, uh, as I said, he was very involved in, in all of these activities. Um, I only wanted to tell you about that egg ration because that became a, a, a lifetime story. Um, I said to our Hever, in order to get the ration, we have to go to, we're in Kiryat Moshe, and only in Tel Aviv are you registered, uh, only in Jerusalem are you registered for a particular shop. You can't just walk into any shop. Because of Dov Yosef, we had rations. So we decided, or I said, let's gather all of our, we were seven uh, girls, uh, not only girls, we were seven Americans, we'd get in our building, we'll gather all of our uh, um, ration tickets, and one person will get exposed uh, to going. We were lucky because the Hadassah had provided uh, metal nets, so hand grenades could not be thrown on the buses. They wouldn't, but shooting, yes. So you had to duck the whole way. You had to go through a mema from Kiryat uh, Moshe to Jerusalem. And where was the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the grocery man? Was right in the Ben Yehuda Street area that had and been King George that had been um, terrorized not a week before. And he's standing in the rubble and recognizes me and says, oh, I knew you would come, the Americans. He saved uh, the ration for us. So there he had, I had seven uh, ration cards, seven eggs, um, cut a piece of matzah. Uh, somebody wrote a book of what were you rationed, and I actually was able to tell them all the things mm -hmm. <laughs> that I had been rationed. Uh, and he puts it, we didn't have shopping bags, and he puts it in a thing, and the egg's on top. And I somehow get back on the bus. I do a quick Shema Yisrael duck when I have to. And I arrive. However, as I arrive, I trip on the step, going into the house. And all the chever are out there with outstretched hands waiting to receive me and the supplies. And they ran around catching, you know, whatever they could catch. And we had a muddy omelet. And I used to tell my kids years later, whenever I made a matzah brai, and they said how good it was. Nothing compared to what we ate during the siege of Jerusalem, <laughs> the muddy omelet, which we added to with a little... We Americans used to get packages until it was no longer possible of powdered eggs, powdered milk, little powdered uh, coffee, always the jars broke, and you'd have to uh, wipe up the mess. However, they never sent powdered ammunition. That was the, <laughs> <laughs> that was the joke. That. Um, heading into May, did you have any sense of what was going to happen? What no, we Goring only knew that something to had to happen because the British was supposed to leave. And we didn't know in what state they would leave us. The, uh, by the end of April, uh, all the uh, uh, mail services were discontinued, all the public services. In other words, they were going to leave us in pretty much chaos. But there were things happening. Certain, um, uh, what, what I haven't mentioned was uh, that the, um, there were foreign volunteers being organized abroad, and they became what is called the Machal which was a big, big secret because the Americans had an embargo. Anything you did was against the law. So nobody knew about these people um, who were Zionists or, or not. Uh, some of them were just uh, people who had finished their service in the American army and heard about this coming of, of age of, a, of, an America, of a Zionist dream and wanted to be part of something new. They were ready to um, give their expertise and military know-how. So most of those uh, machalniks, as we called them, were. The key and leading first one was a colonel from West Point called Mickey Marcus. And that uh, is a story unto itself because, regrettably, he was killed by friendly fire like Stonewall Jackson and a couple of others before him. However, to this day, um, what he did uh, became the basis for um, the IDF. And so uh, what the Americans and Canadians, not just Americans, Canadians, from 44 different countries, about 3,500 volunteers poured in, coming clandestinely uh, in order to help the Jewish state. Where were you May 14th? Uh, 
I was in Dir Yassin, with the shutters and the lights out, sitting huddled on a, uh, around a um, battery radio. Electricity was off and on all the time. I had no electricity. And trying to hear what was being said at the United Nations. Were they recognizing the state or weren't they? And this is where I was. And waiting for our unit, that very night, a unit had gone out to the old city because in Dir Yassin, we had, I started to say that the British, though they were leaving, a couple of them uh, began to realize that there was something here. They, they didn't like the position the Jews were put in, and they kind of were helpful. They sold a tank, or gave a tank, or were amenable. And uh, in Dir Yassin, we had the tank unit, three whole, not so whole, tanks. <laughs> and, we, and from there, Yeah, there were some British soldiers who kind of went across the line. Ah, tell them. Yeah. Go ahead. At some point, there were some British who didn't take the British line and tried to help out. They either gave us or closed their eyes and enabled us to get a hold of arms and equipment that we would not have been able to, including uh, the three tanks that were... Uh, billeted in um, Dir Yassin, where I was the nurse. And it was a big uh, secret, yeah? And uh, they were the first, um, they left on a mission to liberate the Jewish um, section of the old city. They never made it through that night, but that was the first attempt. Later it was, of course, uh, liberated and uh, the people, uh, it's a long story, but the people who were there, I came to know, they were neighbors, the daughter of the chief rabbi of the Yeshua. Um, when did you leave Jerusalem? Well, um, there was this um, period of incessant, um, the British were pulling out. It was clear that there was going to be invasion from the Arab states. We didn't know how we were going to deal with it. Um, I, I have to get to the 14th of, of uh, May, when in Tel Aviv, we heard rumors that Ben-Gurion, rumors, we didn't, we had no contact, that in ben Tel Aviv, they're declaring a Jewish state. Um, that in the museum, they had the ceremony. I don't know, it was weird, because we're in Jerusalem, fighting partisans, and in Tel Aviv, they're already behaving like they're going to announce a Jewish state to the whole world. And I noticed, um, as I said, we had no electricity, everything was rumors. But 50 years later, I read in Ben-Gurion's diary that he had written that day, the world was sure that within 10 days, at the most, not a soul would be alive in Israel. So that was the mood. No, we didn't think what will be. Well, how do we get through this day to the next? Knowing that everything we did or said or, or acted upon was important. That's all I can tell you. The sense of, of history and, and not martyrdom, but we're here defending. Who else if not us? Look within yourself for the... We, of course we were scared. With all this bombing, my teeth would chatter. And I would say, ooh, and I'd take a deep breath. They call it now breathing like for uh, birth, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Take a deep breath. This is it. Summon every ounce of energy or ingenuity that you can because that's all you can do. Stand up to the hour. Anyhow, uh, the siege was broken. Uh, there were two, uh, I, we, we couldn't understand why the United Nations, why isn't the world coming in to defend uh, the old city, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the population, the, the, where are, where's the world, you know? Couldn't imagine that we would be deserted in that way, which we were. But we were not deserted of our own um, ingenuity. We couldn't use the road to Tel Aviv, we built a new road. In the uh, period of ceasefire, but I started to go back, that the chief uh, 
uh, of the, the, the main person in this uh, Machal activity was Mickey Marcus, and he was indiscriminate, uh, tragically killed. During that ceasefire, the road that he envisioned was able to be, um, uh, it's a heroic road. It meant, again, carrying stones on your back at night and filling up the holes and covering a gorge, a uh, long story that uh, the road you now travel to Jerusalem is called the Burma Road, a heroic road built under the most unusual circumstances. And um, the siege got broken by the boys who were in, and Yehuda was among them, my friend, who were in the jeeps that were used to uh, in order to pave that road, they had a, a, a gully, and they just handed the jeeps over by hand, over the gully. It was a narrow strip, but you couldn't fill it up until you... And that was the, uh, the siege of Jerusalem, as far as I was concerned. And it was a small jeep convoy of Palmach boys, and they came over the hills behind uh, Latrun, where the chief fighting was going on, and um, they raised our morale sky high. And uh, Yuda came looking in, in Israel, in, sorry, in Jerusalem. Everybody had a name, in, uh, a code name. You, most people in the Haganah had a code name. When I was uh, recruited for the Haganah, there were six Sipporahs in our unit. And they caught, started calling me Tzipi HaAmerikait, the American Sippy. So Yuda came looking for me in Diri Asin. He gets, he comes with, uh, with this... Uh, uh, leaving Jerusalem, I mean, it was an enormous thing. And they told him I was in, uh, I thought he was already dead. I didn't hear any rumors. Uh, Harel unit, half of them died. Anyhow, uh, somebody knocks on the shutter. Who? The enemy's going to knock on the shutter? Misha, you know. Yuda, what are you doing here? Come out. Not only is he uh, alive and well, but he has brought me the present of presence in America. I said to the kids once that I was speaking to a school group, and I said, mind you, I've been bought a house in Savion. I was given a diamond ring. But that present really got me an orange <laughs> and a tomato. We hadn't seen vegetables. So one of the kids said, did you marry him? I said, for an orange or <laughs> a tomato? No way. But it was wonderful uh, to have that. Uh, and he took back, he suggested that he's going back, and they will be now filling up that road, and uh, he'll be part of that. And what could he do for me? I said, our parents, three months, haven't heard a word. They don't know if we're dead or alive in Jerusalem. Can you take my letters, which I've been writing, and get them in Tel Aviv. They had an air force, they had a mail service, they were the beginnings of a state, and we're completely uh, isolated from all that, still in, under siege. And so uh, he uh, said, you know what? I don't know, nothing is for sure these days, but I'll put them in my breast pocket. They may stop a bullet, which will be a good thing. And when I get to Hulda or wherever, I'll transfer it like a Pony Express. He transferred it to another um, friend of ours who transferred it. And eventually they got to Tel Aviv where Jerry Renov took them uh, to Czechoslovakia where they had an air transport to pick up arms and ammunition and mailed it from there. That's the story of um, the terror. You know what? I say to myself, uh, it was a, a miracle that it arrived, these letters. And my mother opens them up and suddenly realizes that I'm saying I'm alive, I'm well. And this one, the only person who really, it was Moshe Perlstein who was killed and Arnier was wounded. And I give a full report on everybody that I know and call up all their mothers and you're the first letter out of besieged Jerusalem. So she became what later became the Association of American Parents Abroad. Um, she founded that. Anyhow, um, I... It's hard for me to describe this business of a state. The whole time we were in Jerusalem, we were simply fighters. And during that uh, uh, ceasefire, the official ce there was eventually an official ceasefire after Marcus was killed, I marched myself up to Magen David Adom, 
and I said, I have been a very good girl. I came as a student. I didn't leave. I took on assignments in every dirty place. I'd been to Sheikh Sharach. I'd been to about 10 places already um, uh, where, uh, and then Dir Yassin. And now I need to see the Jewish state. That's what it was all about. Please, they weren't letting anybody leave Jerusalem, not of military age. And I was needed. I said, just, and then I see he isn't paying much attention. Then he looks up, ah, American, speaks English, nurse. Will you accompany, uh, uh, the, the condition is that you accompany the first convoy sponsored by the United Nations out of Jerusalem under siege, okay? And this convoy is made up of only of, uh, mostly of uh, amputees who cannot be treated in Jerusalem, and I'm supposed to accompany them. And you left, we left uh, 10 in the morning, and uh, there was the uh, Jordanians had to approve us, the UN had to approve us, our people had to approve us. The fact that I was an American and Jewish and a nurse was a big thing. So I was in charge of this, this uh, convoy of, of wounded. What could I give them? We had no morphium, sulfur. I was desperately cheerful, holding hands, mopping by. What could I do? But that was the, the assignment. And suddenly, when we passed, I don't remember, it was Holder, we all realized we're already in the Jewish state. We've crossed the border. And there is a shouting and banging with the crutches and canes on the ambulance doors and windows. Will I ever forget that sound in my ear? Suddenly, this is what it was all about. They forgot their pain, we forgot it. And I get the uh, convoy to Tel Aviv. And until I deposit those who needed to be in um, rehabilitations and those who needed activity, there were all kinds of places I had to deliver them to. It's after midnight. I don't know a soul in Tel Aviv. I don't know where to put my weary head. And I'm not going to play damsel in distress. I will not cry. I will not. <laughs> you know? And I take myself to the seashore. And I say, well, I'll sleep on the sand. And then I said, listen, they've got an army here. They must have a welfare officer. I mean, I'm from JWB. <laughs> when there's an army, there's a welfare officer. And they tell me it's on the street. And I go over there. I come in. And everybody in the place, where are you from? I said, Jerusalem. What? You know, and they give me chits to the Savoy Hotel to sleep and um, uh, chits to eat for the night. I'm a soldier. They treat me like one with all. And the commander is coming to take me to breakfast. Mm -hmm. Breakfast turned out to be horrifying because that was the morning of the Altalena. The war was following me around. We're sitting in... And they asked me, do I want two eggs? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I got sick from eating. You don't eat in Jerusalem. <laughs> but then after a day of, of this, uh, that's another whole story with the Altanana, but I realized that I had to get back. I couldn't live this life in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv. It wasn't my war at all. And so I gathered as much goodies as I could, and I got onto a jeep convoy that was going back two days later. Do you recall the Altalina? Do you recall what was going on? It, what was going on was that was the knife of my first freedom. And the army had organized for me tickets to see, what is this Aunt Jemima play by Tennyson with the Aunt Jemima? I don't know. I only remember that this is uh, uh, Aunt Jemima. And I was hysterical, an Israeli uh, playing Aunt Jemima, you know what I mean, with a southern accent in Hebrew. It was too hysterical. And the, the, the guy who uh, also had a ticket was a brigadier general from Jerusalem. It was very, we had a, suddenly there's an air raid warning, everybody into shelters, and that was the Altalena. And we never made it to a shelter, but we sat in a car through the whole night listening to Begin and listening to all the activity and waiting for something to be blown up. Well, my commander next to me says, they were going to blow it up, they already would have, you know? They're probably shooting at individuals. on, And that's exactly what... But I was so mad when I heard Jews shooting Jews. That's another one I couldn't get. And then I realized, but this Ben-Gurion has vision. He doesn't want two armies in one army. Absolutely. And so it's always having to adjust to things that you can't possibly foresee, don't know how to react to. And when they used to ask me, what did you think? Who thought? You were so busy staying alive, trying to absorb what was happening, what you could do, where it was going, and how your being part of it was going to help because nobody, you were what was happening. 
Each one of us was defending. After two days, you returned to Jerusalem? I go back to Jerusalem, and my first assignment actually was in Sheikh Jarrah. And the first thing was that I'd given an infirmary where there was uh, full of uh, sandbags. You know what I mean? It was uh, an outpost, which had formerly been a tipat cholav, uh, what do you call a tipat cholav in English? Yes. A uh, nursery uh, uh, for uh, new mothers. And because it was known as a place for new mothers, somebody was dragging in a woman about to give birth. Well, I can tell you that wasn't in our first aid course. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell I'm supposed to do, and I could barely talk to her because um, I understood her French, but she didn't understand my... Um, I couldn't speak French, but I understood because we lived in Canada. And I gathered from the two women, I said, don't go away, you hold her and you help me because I don't know what to do. She's telling us she's the seventh child. And she had a husband in the Galil she hadn't heard from. And suddenly, I am the midwife. And I managed to get through to an ambulance, and they come and take it. And I, then I did this reflection. Another child, another boy, another soldier. The miracle of birth, it was all a lot for me to take in. But by morning, I had other things to worry about. <laughs> you know, there you are. At some point, you returned to New York. No, before that, I had you asked me about Jerusalem. It came to an end um, with my uh, realizing that the war was at a slow down in Jerusalem. And my friends, almost all of whom, had gone to Tel Aviv and were now, uh, Carmi, all of these guys were in the Air Force. In fact, the head of intelligence in the Air Force was the head of our youth movement, um, Nat Cohen. And he said, get Sipora out of Jerusalem. And I was ready to go back to doing something in my own profession. And uh, they took me on, uh, well, they, they managed to get me out on my birthday. So I remember distinctly that I started on the 1st of August uh, getting to uh, Tel Aviv in the headquarters of the Air Force and uh, being asked to choose a job. I mean, there were 100 jobs and um, in intelligence, and I chose the idea of uh, writing up the history we were doing very important things that nobody was making a note about. If they sent me on a reconnaissance to see where to put the next uh, infirmary, I was still in the medical corps, actually, formally, uh, but the medical corps of the Air Force. So I was uh, very involved in that uh, period of the early um, um, development of the Air Force. And that became another period of my history. Yeah. Your parents? Collective. Go ahead. Where were we? You're talking about the end of the war. Yes, and that's right. You know, I have one observation, though. Israel is still fighting for its right to exist. And terror is still part of our lives today, as it was then, as if nothing had changed. But let me go back to the end of the war, and it was time to go home for a visit. Um, my sister was getting married. I never made the wedding, but I did go back. And... Um, my first um, assignment was, as I told you, my father was always involved with whatever was going on in Jewish things, and he made it known that his daughter, who had been through the War of Independence, was now in uh, coming to New York. So they got on to me to serve as the executive assistant to the Consul General in New York. And this was a period of great excitement because Israel was just being introduced into the United Nations, and for the first time ever, a Israeli foreign minister was coming to speak to the United Nations, and that was Moshe Sharet. And I was arranging the, um, his speech. He wouldn't let me correct anything. In the end, he accepted all my comments. He knows English, right? His Turkish English. Anyhow, we made an impact on him. He let me correct his com some things. And he's, there's a, a party for him. And uh, we're in the Vanderbilt house with the red, you know, like in the movies, you see the red, the steps up and the red. And I'm greeting everybody downstairs. And um, in order to get ready for this event, I'm the secretary executive there. And I go, I bring my little cocktail, black cocktail dress, and I go in for a shower in the Vanderbilt's. Uh, bathroom with gold faucets and mother of pearl swans. I mean, I come from Brooklyn. You don't take baths <laughs> in places like that. <laughs> and I'm reluctant to get out for anything. And outside, they're shouting, Zippy, there's a spy in the building. 
kind of spy. I'm supposed to check him out. So I have to dress and run out. And who is it? My husband-to-be, who is the, um, representing the, uh, he's a military attaché in Washington, assistant military attaché, and he's come to talk to our Shin Bet department upstairs, and they're not letting him through because he's wearing a uniform nobody ever saw. We didn't have uniforms. They sent people to Obegay to order something that looked like a uniform for a dress uniform. It looked like a bellboy. It was purple with red uh, piping. I mean, ridiculous. But after two minutes of talking, I realized he is not a spy. He's just wearing an idiotic uniform. And um, I uh, let him get through. I go back to dressing. I go back to the opening of the party. He goes to talk to whoever he needs to talk to. And I must tell you that I was the only unmarried girl in the embassy and the only unmarried male was a guy who worked in Shin Bet. Yeah? And usually when we had to go out, so we were dated. I mean, very good friends. And I'm standing below greeting everybody who arrives. And this uh, military attaché arrives, and shalom, yes, we've met before. <laughs> and um, I go up, and uh, he's originally from Poland. So he is listening to the Russians talk and reporting back. Finally, my friend from Shinbet comes over and says to me, listen, we're all going out for a big event afterward. It's uh, 5 o'clock. Everybody's dressed up and no place to go. Um, and I usually, I was going to go with you, but I can't. Would you mind if my friend from Jerusalem, from uh, Washington, our military attaché, replaces me? You know, blind date stuff. I said, oh, him, I met him. Okay. And uh, we go out to this um, uh, Billy Rose's Long Stem Road. Who will forget that? that nightclub, and he turns out to be a charming man and a marvelous dancer, and we just hit it off from the... What was his name? Ah. Skanaluf Yosef Porat, Joseph Porat, and um, I don't know. It started with being bombarded with weekend visits, because we're both working, and he would come up and uh, maybe a month, this was uh, two months, okay? And then he's being posted back to Israel. And Golda Meir is arriving uh, to raise money for funds. It's Yom Ma'ut. And the embassy in Washington is making, uh, in New York is making a big do, and I'm involved. And the Washington people are coming down, uh, and it's happening in Madison Square Garden. And this is the moment he decides to ask me to marry him. How? <laughs> By flashing this diamond ring at me. Listen, I had a lot of boyfriends. Nobody ever handed me a diamond ring. I mean, this was serious. He's a very serious man. And I, I'm not going to let this guy go out of my life, but who wants to decide so quickly? I remember locking myself in my room before I dressed for this garden <laughs> event. Madison Square Garden is a big place. The embassy was sitting over there, and the consulate people were sitting over here in boxes. And he said, if you accept, you wave your hand with the ring on it. We wouldn't have time to meet before. And if you don't, I'll understand, but you'll be sorry. <laughs> I deserve <laughs> someone like you. I don't think I've never forgot that line for 60 years. I deserve someone like you. <laughs> Hardly knew him, you know? But I, we hit it off. Anyhow, um, at some moment, I'm sitting next to the Consul General and all these people. And I, as I said, I locked myself in my room to do thinking. And I come to the, and I still hadn't decided, but by the time I came to the event, I sat down and I looked at our, uh, the uh, Consul General was then, uh, oh dear, <laughs> Arthur Lurie. And I looked and I said, Arthur, I think I better tell you this before I wave to the people in the, con in the embassy <laughs> over there. And I put on the ring. He says, what's going You can't leave now. <laughs> you know, I mean, was, and I waved the ring, and that was it. And then later, my husband told me that he'd acquired the ring from a friend in Brooklyn, and he had said to him, I'm not sure she's going to accept, but can I return it tomorrow morning? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got engaged, <laughs> believe it or not. I never thought I'd be persuaded by a ring. <laughs> uh, anyhow, he had to go back, and we got married. The first wedding in the uh, Israel uh, territory in America and the uh, embassy in 2,000 years. They wrote it up in Mariv. The um, 
uh, best man was um, Chaim Herzog, who later became president of Israel. And his wife made all the sandwiches <laughs> for the party because they didn't have a budget for weddings in the, <laughs> in the embassy. And uh, it was a lovely wedding. And, uh, and then uh, he had to go back first. And by the time he had to go back, I was already pregnant. And so um, we went straight to Tzahala, where he had... Uh, uh, as, as a, um, he's a very organized man. As an, uh, even as a younger person, he had enough units, uh, you know, went by points from the British Army and the Haganah and all that to have a home, although he's one of the few unmarried people who had signed up for a home even before. His whole family was killed, other than one cousin uh, in the uh, Holocaust. And Did for him, a house Israel? and a wife was a very important thing. Did he come to Israel before the Holocaust? Or he after? came under unusual circumstances also. The Zionist home, uh, not the father, he was very active uh, in uh, the Aliyat um, uh, They have a museum in uh, Tel Yitzchak with all the books and pictures of him as one of the leading. He came, as I came to the university on a student visa, he came to the Technion in 1937. Wow. And did, um, his father came to visit because he couldn't understand what he's doing here. And that was the last time he saw the family. And persuaded, no, excuse me, and persuaded him at least to come back for a visit to the family, that they would let him. You know what I mean? They, he was afraid like I. You come back to the family, and you never get back to where you want to be. He had another two years, and he went back to visit in 39, and lands in um, Poland. He was from Poland, from Lodz, and landed there um, two or three days before the war broke out, and Poland was invaded. He organized, it was Yom Kippur, and he didn't look Jewish. He had blue eyes and then uh, red hair. Didn't look the least bit Jewish. And uh, he organized a, uh, a group of students who had come back to visit, um, to leave. And that's a, a fabulous story of how they hid and got on trains, and, and they, they, about 24 people whom he uh, led to come back during the war and how they made it through. And um, you mentioned you were pregnant at some point. Did yes, I was about five months, uh, four months pregnant when I came to Tzahala. And that was a whole other thing. I mean, the guy I had not married in America was because he had a house in the suburbs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't going to live that kind of life. I was going to be a foreign correspondent. Mm -hmm. I was going to do. Well, I ended up in a house in the suburbs in Sala, in a wonderful new life. And this was an army, um, Shikun. Everybody was somebody. Uh, down the street was Moshe Dayan. Across the street was uh, the high-ranking officer next to me. Was, and that's how I lived. Uh, we were there for over 20 years. What are your children's names? Uh, Gidon is the oldest. And it was a very, uh, my husband was in the army, and he was so excited, a new generation, his entire family. And it was something very special. And uh, the picture um, at the Brit Mila, I tell you, everybody looks like they should have been photographed separately <sighs> because there was such an uh, accomplishment, you know? Another generation. It's happening. It's happening. And... Um, and the, all of these army. One, one officer, who was the chief medical officer, was so excited when he heard we got married. He said, um, many happy returns. He didn't know English well enough. <laughs> so he thought he was saying Mazel Tov. What he wrote was many happy <laughs> returns of a wedding. <laughs> we, were, we were very, um, uh, we were the pride of the army at that moment. And the youngest son was uh, three years later, born on the very same day, April 21st. Um, is uh, Jonathan, Jonathan. Is there anything you want to add before we wrap up? Yes, I want to tell you that um, I was very proud that I had, because when people ask me, what was it like to be here during that year? Who can remember? Everybody's, but I had it effortlessly in letters that I wrote home. And I was very proud that I could say that these letters I had captured uh, what happened for those who lived through it, for those who wished they had, and as I said, for those who wanted to know what it was like to be part of uh, 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 a state in the making. It has been a, a terrific challenge, and I think 
but I just have to read you the final um, letter because uh, the letter I wrote on the 29th of November that I read you earlier, a year later, here we are in an army with, an, uh, with a state, and I'm reflecting. I'm, I'm, I'm based in Haifa, and uh, from the November 29th, Haifa Bay, 1948, only a year. And I write from the roof of the hospital, I watch this morning's parade, partisans, soldiers standing. I'll, I'll cut it short. And I listened, but my thoughts went back, drifted back to what had been the year before. And now we march, we form ranks, we listen, and the, the, the salute every, from every army. The Americans this way, the British this way, the Turks this way. The Israelis, Bichlal, didn't want to salute. They were very, no officers. It was a, a balagan. And uh, the command runs out, uh, and we run to the canteen and what's on for tonight. And nobody is mentioning the important things that happened this year. And this is what's killing me. I'm saying this pathetic parade was a fulfillment. 2,000 years in the, in the making. And it, it wasn't mustered in one year. From all the years, and next year the parade will probably be better and we'll know marching orders and, we'll, and this is exactly what happened. But we will have forgotten how it was. And I write, like everything else, everything is happening too fast, but I can't help thinking of Moshe and Oded and Tzvi and Yaakov and Amnon and a hundred others who danced with me through the night on the 29th of November. And the lump in my throat is too big in my mouth. And was it only a year ago? Worlds ago. Dir Yassin, Burma Road, Sheikh Sharach, Katamon, and I mention all the places I've been. I can't believe this year. So much has happened. But the most important thing of, by far is the birth of the state. And I've been part of it. And it will forever be part of me. And I guess I'm telling you, I intend to see this war through and then remain on because this is now my home. And you must know that this letter appeared in a book called Letters of the Century. Big fat book. The only letter in the book about the state of Israel being born or the War of Independence. And I'm three pages away from Albert Einstein, five pages away from Mark Twain, half a page from President Truman, in very good company, <laughs> telling all about how it was during that period. You certainly deserve to be there. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> now I have to start oh, yeah, here. Right. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, what I didn't do was flash the book, and I'd like to. Sure. Okay. You can start. What am I looking at? I'm, no, you're who am I talking to? Oh, I see. Well, I. you hear all right? Yeah. I'd like to tell you, first of all, we're talking about a book of letters, and so I must show you um, this is the book, Letters from Jerusalem, and it has gone through many printings, and uh, it's had a life of its own, um, uh, starting with the uh, 40th anniversary of the state when the uh, Association for Americans and Canadians uh, printed it for the first time. And these were the original letters. They were air forms of the uh, British Mandatory Government. On top, you'll see Palestine. It cost 25 mils, 10 mils, I'm sorry. I don't know what the 25 is. And uh, you wrote on the inside and folded it. You could write on the inside and fold it up, and this was the airmail, okay? And then this is my leaving. My sister uh, kept a, um, everything I sent, starting with um, the first day, Zippy's, Borowski's, her trip to Palestine, and she had it in a black-paged um, album, and wrote in white, white ink, she had a beautiful handwriting, so wherever I could that was left from uh, that uh, book, here she says, Zippy left New York on Saturday, September 27, 1947, aboard the American export line ship Marine Jumper at 5 p.m. from Pier 84. If I'd had this in front of me when you asked me, I could have told you anything that happened, she made it. Now, on the 50th anniversary of my arrival in Israel, I prepared an album for my family, and that's what we're looking at now. First, uh, the announcement from the ZOA 
This was called The Horizon. This was the, uh, pay, uh, the um, newsletter or the paper of the um, <coughs> Zionist Organization of America with a picture of me and the fact that uh, Ms. Baraski, who heads the uh, leader in Young Judea, Masada, and other Zionist youth activities, was unanimously elected president of the Tikva Israel District 92 at a recently held election. Well, it didn't take long for after that when I was awarded the scholarship. And among the passengers on the American export line Marine Jumper when it left New York recently going to Palestine were Kami Chani, Sipor Borowski, both of whom are going to study at the Hebrew University for a year under a scholarship granted them by the ZOA. Uh, Judith Samfer, another ZOA scholarship, has also booked passage for an early. In other words, we didn't travel together. I hadn't remembered that. Now, what was this? This is a pound note of the British uh, government, <laughs> which I must tell you, when things, when I was in the uh, Haganah and everybody was so afraid that girls, the British were very nice and very polite about girls, women. The Arabs were not reputed to be so beseder, and so I decided I'm going to take a pound note, stick it in my brazier. If I ever get captured, I'll either talk my way out of it or bribe my way out of it. Well, I came home safe and sound with the pound intact. I don't know if it's worth anything now. <laughs> Anyhow, there are the pictures on the boat uh, saying goodbye um, at the oh the reception room at Pier. I only have to read what she wrote to carry me back. Um, North River, New York uh, departure. And here is the ship and my family saying goodbye to me. Just a second. Just a second. Say when. Okay. And uh, it was a completely reconditioned army troop ship, no place to, they were all back to back. And here was the Hevra um, on that trip. There was Kami, here's Kami, and um, Rachel Francis, I don't remember them all, uh, Dove Ben Abba, and Eddie the Arab. Now, Eddie just followed me around wherever I was going. Here he is in a suit. Oh, did I have a figure then, then? Wow, wow, wow. Anyhow, so here we are. <laughs> Eddie the Arab, who got off at Beirut. Tell me when we're moving out. And the daily routine was to sit around on the deck, 17 days of that. Okay? No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. There was Dove Benaba and Jay Brickman, a rabbi, and Menachem Walter, and Howie. They were the names. I don't remember all of them. Yes, this is Jay Brickman. He's a rabbi okay. now. Okay. And then there is arrival in Jerusalem, in Palestine. I arrived on October 13th and the Haifa Technion taken from the hotel where we stayed. I mean, it was all like picture postcards um, being uh, shot in front of us. And that's the student-to-be. I told you I always wore a khaki shirt and a modest blouse, never wore any of the stuff that I had. And this um, um, with uh, Leon and Rivka Egris, they both passed away. And uh, the American vice president, uh, uh, Wallace, uh, Henry Wallace, arrived um, in Jerusalem and uh, invited all the American students, mostly the GIs, for a breakfast. And um, this was the um, breakfast picture, and he was charming. And these were all a bunch of rabbis, as I recall, Jay and uh, Brickman and all of them. And um, um, more of the same. Under the and, and they spoke about veterans at the Hebrew University. Now we get to memorabilia. For example, this is the invitation to the opening ceremonies of the school year of Tashach, uh, 1947, October 29th, at the Hebrew University. And this is the bus ticket. You know, every little thing I did, my sister made a thing of it. And this was my student um, card. Borowski, Tsipora, Sylvia. And um, the day and place of residence. Now, um, then I move out of the uh, American quarters and into a building that's standing out of nowhere, um, without a street, uh, nothing around it. I mean, we can't even have mail delivered there because it has no address. That's 
my apartment up here. And I organized, I told you, the kids uh, to um, a road project. At the appointed hour, every student in the building had to place a designated number of rocks to make a path to the entrance to our building. And um, now the road is completed, and we have a street named after me, Rehov Borovsky. <laughs> Here it is. Okay, then we go on to the beginnings of the Haganah. These were the guys on, in our building. This was Ami, who was the head of the uh, Palmach unit. Uh, sorry, the Haganah unit, I believe. Uh, Yuda was the head of the Palmach unit. This is um, um, Don, who was an extra neighbor. He was from uh, France. And um, this is the English girl with whom I roomed, Rachel Cohen. And this is Morty Chertoff, whose family I knew back from America, uh, uh, from the Theological Cere Seminary, where his father was a professor and his sister was a friend. And uh, he was a reporter for the Jerusalem Post, which was then the Palestine Post. And this was uh, Avalon, a friend from New York. And that was Rachie Lev, uh, a very close friend, whose brother was the head of the chaplaincy service at the uh, Jewish uh, Welfare Board. And that's Yudha Stamford, the third recipient. And that's Morty um, Rubin, who was a professor at the Technion in, in uh, chemistry, who was a close friend. And um, I would send my sister all of these memorabilia. Here was... Uh, sheets, E-E-E-T-S, or a pillow, 1L, or a towels, everything, um, uh, slacks and shore, no T. I mean, note the spelling, you know, this was the laundry list. Then there were tickets, um, bus tickets to the Chevron, uh, Hamakasher, um, places that I visited, um, a movie uh, ticket, uh, entrance to um, Bet, um, the Israel Betzalel Museum. Whatever I did, I sent the ticket and my sister would collect them. Then there was the 29th or the 30th of November, which became Independence Day, and the United Nations decision creating a Jewish state in Palestine. You must know that anything written in white on black is for my sister's original um, album, and her descriptions are so well worded. I mean, I just dabbled in here, but she wrote them well, and they looked beautifully written. So there's Dov Ben Abba, who was the, a Harvard uh, a man who had been in the American Air Force. And here was uh, me. Uh, I'm holding Haaretz, and he's holding Davar, and Morty is holding Haboka, and Ray Noam, who took the picture, uh, he was holding Hatsofer. And we were just so excited. The whole night we had danced together. Uh, this is a picture of the new Capitol building, in essence, the most important spot at the moment, because from these rooftops, um, the, um, the courtyard, uh, the, the people, um, and, and the letter I wrote you about the decision was made from this building. This became a very famous picture, which is um, reprinted in the Mossaf in 92 as a historic picture. Okay, now we're into Jerusalem, and this is the scene. I don't know how, with a computer, they were able to produce these in the Hebrew edition, which I didn't show you. Um, all of these pictures have come out beautifully. I didn't have them in the English at that time. And here's King George Road and the, um, the excitement and Zion Square and Dove Morty Me in front of the first door to decorate the windows in honor of Independence Day taken 48 hours, after 48 hours of no sleep and too much celebrating. And um, this is Yom Achlatat Um. It's a special, uh, uh, Karen Kayemet put out a special something. This is um, in Tel Aviv, Independence Day. Um, uh, the spirit of 47, you know, just to show you how it was. And um, this is Golda Meir leaving at that moment. And this is the, the backyard of the Jewish Agency building, which is um, where we couldn't go through to the old city. And this is me on somebody's porch. What is she right here? The balcony of Haaretz. The fellow nearest the flag, Lazar, next day was stabbed severely in the Arab section while following up on the story. 
part of the crowd left to right, Dove, Morty, me, uh, Uri, and a couple of others. I don't even remember their names. And this is the day after independence announcement. The Arabs um, started already in Jerusalem um, uh, and um, Jewish-owned uh, stores in the commercial area were being attracted. And this is the really important uh, map. I like to show it here because I colored it in so you could see quite distinctly what the partition of Palestine was. Anything in orange was the Jewish state. In green was the Arab state, the Mediterranean Sea, Egypt, Transjordan. Jerusalem, a small enclave, an international enclave, uh, and the Arabs would have had absolutely almost uh, 5,500 square meters for the Jewish state, 4,500. Could have had the, that state on a silver platter if they'd accepted it then instead of invaded us and um, caused a war. Uh, this turns out to be instructions for guarding duty. I had to translate it for all the American students um, when to shoot, uh, the purpose of the, yeah, yeah, well, uh, generally. All tenants in the building are requested to see and sign their names, and here they are, the people who signed in, and the organization of the duty rush from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., and how we divided and watched our building. Then enlisting in the Haganah, this is Yuda, who was my first commander and taught us the hand arms and all of the things we had to do. And this is the Palestine Post press offices destroyed. Morty worked there. Uh, uh, Dove Benabo, all my friends worked there. And so um, uh, then there was first aid for the first time on Ben Yehuda Street. Just to show you where that was and what it looked like the morning of. Sorry. Ah, this was another close friend, Moshe Sachs. Oh, I think we've gotten involved with some glue here. Sorry, I took out pictures. My kids used to take the pictures to their classes, and some of them never got returned. Um, this is the vow, uh, the um, induction vow to the Haganah, which I found in the Haganah Museum 50 years later. Of all the things in a nimatz here, ki mitoch hait nadvuti shit, vahakara chof shit, free will, ani nichneset lirgun hagana haivri beeretz Israel. I mean, that's it, you know. And this was the siege of Jerusalem, where I am assigned um, as a medic after the first aid uh, to receive and send out the convoys from behind the trees here in uh, Kiryat Moshe. Can you show the actual armband again? Yeah. This is what made me officially Magen David Adom, number 347, Yerushalayim. And that's what you're wearing in the picture. That's right. In other words, that's my insane. We didn't get white caps and clothes, but that's what we got, okay? And this, if you can't see it, is the convoys um, being um, camouflaged behind trees before they set out here are the trucks setting out uh, for um, uh, the, uh, and here I am, probably the first or second assignment in an Arab village. And here is the uh, road convoy approaching Jerusalem. And this is Merkaz HaMifkad L'Sheruta Am. The uh, Jewish agency gave us a kind of a, a card to identify that we were helping to defend Jerusalem. You couldn't say Haganah and all of that. And then there was the underground stuff. If you were seen talking to someone, and somebody always slipped you as if a business card where it said you are requested to, to refrain from careless talk, telephone number one, turn over, keep your bloody mouth shut. <laughs> that was to help the Americans remember they weren't supposed to give away information. That's the edition of the Jerusalem Post that came out the day the State of Israel was born. Now, uh, this is an announcement from the American mission. Desires to call to the attention of all American citizens residing in Israel provisions kach kach that you may not uh, vote in a, in a political election, you may not take part in the foreign uh, territory. And this is what we were doing that we weren't supposed to be doing. This is the um, headquarters of Chel Avir. After I left Jerusalem in the siege period and the war was at a standstill temporarily during the second truce, 
I went to the um, uh, Tel Aviv to serve in the um, newborn nascent uh, Air Force. And um, this was my identity card, uh, and I was in intelligence. I still didn't have a job the first week. And this says, this is my marching orders. I thought I kept this. I thought it was interesting. This testifies that Sipora Parat has been given an assignment to Dir Yassin on the, here it is, the 12th of uh, May, 48, 1600, from Magenda Vida Dome. In other words, that was the assignment to set up a... Um, um, ah, I had this here. This is a piece of shrapnel that missed my head <laughs> when I was crawling over um, from Dir Yassin to get back to our rooms in Kiryat Moshe to see if there was any mail and to get a change of clothing and, and uh, some writing paper. Because in this whole uh, um, Arab village, the only, as you'll see later, the only thing I found to write on um, was the back of a, um, a bill for uh, the uh, uh, how do you say, gravel, yeah. This is Magen David Adom, um, my um, identification. This is the ration card of the government of Palestine. Uh, this is another very important um, uh, card because uh, it um, enables me to enter every Air Force installation. And in a joke, Last year, when I was invited to talk uh, to Tel Shamer, and I didn't have my identity card with me, and uh, they o automatically asked for a soldier's number. Now, I can't remember my address, 10673. I remembered in a minute, 60 years later, my soldier's uh, number. And um, by virtue of this, they all gathered around to see what it looks like. This was a um, Cartis Mazon, you know, for... Um, uh, supplies an egg or whatever. Uh, Morty Chertoff wrote an article about American Jews in an Arab village. Um, your mother should see you now, you know, that kind of thing. And here we are. This was um, Tzamerit, her name was. Uh, she later became a uh, BBC announcer, and she was uh, my friend. She lived in the uh, uh, university uh, the, uh, next to... Um, Next to um, Kiryat Moshe was the um, B'nai, um, what do you call it, um, where the uh, Beta college, Kerem. Beta Kerem, where the college was. She the was beginning. a student. She was a student at Beta Kerem, and we became, we had a well. We were the only place with water there. So she befriended me for a hair, a hair wash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're into Dir Yassin for real. It was real, a real outpost. He was the commander. And uh, I believe both of these guys were killed. This is Maccabi Dean, who's still a close friend. He was uh, later a, uh, um, a correspondent for uh, the Jerusalem Post. And this is one of the guys who uh, started the uh, Israel Railways. He was stationed with me there, El Yakim. Here was the tank, one of the three tanks, and that's me on the top with our unit um, being called um, Indir Yassin. Then I have a period with the um, Intelligence Air Force, and of course I'm involved in everything that's going on. I'm sent around. Um, I get the idea, and that's really what was important with regard to uh, the Air Force, was that we were doing all kinds of important things. We were setting up an Air Force. Nobody was making a record of anything. And in my background, I write everything down because I have a bad memory. So I began in my letters home writing about where I was and what I did, and I went to this, and I went to this party, and there it became a kind of a beginning. And then it was introduced into a um, protocol that we would start the history of um, the Air Force. And there's now a three-volume book, and uh, I'm pretty much involved in that one too. And here are Ben Gurion, and uh, Alex Zeloni, a close friend, and Hyman Shamir, who helped um, uh, organize the Machal, oh, and Nehemi Argov, who was the aide de camp of, uh, of Ben Gurion, and Goodman. These were close friends. And um, this is um, Herzl Fishman, who passed away recently, but his father was one of the founders of Bar Ilan University, so we were all together from a different background. This is Rabbi Ezra Spice Handler 
whose wife Skippy was uh, my close friend. And uh, they were all during the Siege of Jerusalem with us. And <laughs> I write here, the, photo the photography section had to finish off a roll of film and they used my face to do it, which is why I have this. <laughs> the uh, chief photographers were our friends. This is uh, uh, a pass. I thought it was interesting and my sister kept it. A pass to be outside of oh, camp. And then there was an important... Oh, yep. This was the Tafki Livui Pizzuim. This was my, um, uh, I told you that I accompanied a, um, a UN convoy out of Jerusalem. This was the uh, traveling orders, Gudat Masa. Okay, and this is Be'er Sheva. As an Air Force person, they began to show us around a little. We'd never seen any of the country, so they organized a trip um, uh, sorry, that's not this. This is a trip to Beersheva uh, with my friend Herzliya to deliver supplies to a lot which had just been captured eight days before. And we went on the back of a truck 18 hours into the desert, sitting on a sack of potatoes, mm -hmm. Herzliya and I. Yeah. I said Samerit, that was her family name. Herzliya Samerit was her name. And that was the first camel I saw in Israel. And this was the truck we traveled to Aqaba. It wasn't a lot, it was Aqaba. And here is that camel. I couldn't get over the camel. Air Force Teul in August 48, seeing you, the new state. You took all these pictures? Yeah. And this was my friend um, who I told you was involved. No, no, that's Burde uh, Brodsky, uh, who was a, a big uh, shaliach for the youth movement. And this is my friend, he was an Englishman, I don't know, Adam, yes, an Englishman. And uh, this is the Kinneret behind me, and Tiberius, and this was very exciting. And this was Acker, where we saw the, uh, the uh, bombs that protected Acker, and Tel Chai, and um, Lebanon from Metula, and from Hanita, and Nahariya. And uh, the Mukhtar of Ramat Yochanan, just uh, till him, just till him. What year was this in? Uh, 48, August 48. And now I'm in Haifa, in Bahad Shnaim, which is the Air Force training base. And as I say, that last letter that I wrote in the book is from this base. I'm the nurse, and um, Bill is one of my patients. He's an American. And this is the doc who is a Swiss, uh, he now runs the uh, TB uh, uh, sanatorium in uh, Tzfat. This is the infirmary, and this is the base, which was formerly a British police station. And that's me in the fields and me on duty, and this is Beth Rutenberg. And this is my savior on that base, Motke, who was the... Um, what, we, what should we call him? He was the, the man who arranged everything. He found me a lamp. He found a room for me. He got me a better mattress. He sent me flowers every Shabbat. I mean, he was my, my uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, soldier in, in, uh, in, in, in need. This was the doc's car, and this was the, the Hevra from Haifa. Lev later became the... Um, um, head of the uh, first uh, trips to Eilat. He was uh, an Air Force man. And here's where the, uh, the, um, the first planes were built. Did I show you that? No. There's two sisters alone and her daughters. She has three daughters. One's a lawyer, one's a doctor, one's a nurse. Everybody was too busy and I stayed with her till her final. Period. Okay. Yeah. This is an important one. This is Hanidon, Sefer Lezichro Shemafaked Marcus. On the first anniversary of the death of Mickey Marcus, the American colonel who had been the first military advisor of uh, Ben Gurion to the Haganah, um, Ben Gurion, who was most impressed with him, um, wanted uh, a book to be put out in English like the hero, the American hero book. Now, uh, I was asked uh, to collect the material. I was then in the Army Publications Department, and I was taken on to the Army Publications Department in order to help produce this uh, material. I said, look, I've never written a book. I'm more of a journalist. I can interview all of the people 
whoever had anything to do with him, starting with the people who recruited him, to the people who served with him, to the people who remember him, and Ben Gurion. And all I can do is recreate the man from what others have to say about him. And that's exactly where we are. And this was the um, a special uh, notification from uh, the um, Ezra Oma, who was Rav Sere, was the Shalish Ramatkal. What do you call a Shalish in English? He was the head of the Ramatkal's office, uh, advising anybody that um, uh, the Ramatkal uh, announces the Gever Tzipora Borovsky um, and Natan Shacham, the writer. He was to do the Hebrew part of my work. Um, uh, of Dim um, uh, in the preparation of a book for the memory to the memory of uh, Colonel Marcus. Please give them every possible assistance. You know, big deal. And this was my assignment in Marachot. That's the Army Publications Department. Um, my press, um, uh, what do you call it, card, which enabled me to follow through on that assignment. And this was. Oh, this had to do with the funds that they were giving me in order to do this. And then we get to the stage where I'm going abroad to visit my family, and I need a release from the IDF, which is now only given through Machal. In other words, if you were not Israeli-born, you had to get it through Machal. And the Israel Defense Forces will certify the was released from service in the reserve force. In other words, that's my, uh, the official one I never got. This was a temporary one. And then we go to a period of uh, the state of Israel, and the first parade, which as the terrible disaster, it had to be called off in the middle, 1949 parade. It just, everybody, nobody knew how to stand in a line. They didn't leave room for the tanks to go through. It was a real mess up. I wasn't in it. I was standing outside watching, probably one of the balconies here. And uh, in 49, my parents arrived for a visit. And here they are at the airport. And uh, Dad and I, on the f at, uh, then my father comes back to attend the first Hebrew Congress. These are some American journalists who were friends. Al Alvin Rosenfeld, I think he was from the New York Times, in fact. And uh, then comes um, the first Hebrew Congress, and, which my father organized and died in Jerusalem on Yom Atzma'ut, um, attending this event. Your father passed away in, in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, yes. Where was he buried? In Mount, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the Mount of Allah, what do you call it? Uh, Harazitim, yes. Was, it, was your mother with him? No, my mother came for the uh, ceremony afterward. How old? Um, I believe he was 71. It was the first Hebrew World Congress organized by Dad, and this is the invitation. Uh, and this is uh, my I first identity card as an Israeli uh, resident. This is what it looks like. And then was... Uh, we're, we're skipping over to um, 1987, which is 40 years later, when the letters are found. My mother passes away. My father passes away. My sister has me come over to America to help go through the piles of paper, because in our family, nobody threw away anything. So if my father wrote a note, Lech, Lechi he would insist on writing me notes in Hebrew. And they didn't understand what it said, you know, go to the store and buy a bottle of milk. I mean, but he was determined that we should know the Hebrew for this, yeah? So um, when he came back to set up the Congress, I came with him. While I was in New York during those few months, I was allowed to get a uh, pass to come back. Um, and that's when I established, I came really because I wanted to be sure that I came back to Israel as a member of the Foreign Office and not by virtue of a, being a wife of a diplomat or whatever. It was even before it was in the summer. I came to accompany my father and help him in the arrangements of this Congress. And then comes 1987 when my parents pass away. I find I'm there going through all kinds of material, throw away, give away, decide later, throw away. Yes, throw away, give away, whatever I'm doing with all this material. And suddenly I find this book 
a dilapidated file with all the letters I ever wrote in chronologic order in an old dilapidated file. And I'm looking at it, and I'm realizing, for me, for my children, for my grandchildren, for other people, this is a personal account of the War of Independence from an I outsider looking in and with the perceptions and insights of an insider participating. That's a book. I'm an editor, you know? But I couldn't deal with it. I wrapped it all up and sent it back to Israel to deal with when I would have time. And that's what happened in 1947. The ACI, the Amer Association of Americans and Canadians in Israel, was looking for a project for the 40th anniversary. And I came to a meeting, I don't remember, and I said, you know, the most interesting thing has happened to me. I suddenly found all the letters that I wrote. I didn't finish the sentence when they all, well, can we get it out as a book? I said, on one condition that I produce it. Because I didn't want to hand it over to any. I know how to produce a book, and that was my profession by this time. I came back as a freelance editor. And so um, we got it out in two months. This was in August and in um, um, Sorry, it was in November, and in December 6th at the Hilton Hotel in Jerusalem, the 31st Zionist Congress, AAC, I had a booth, and I was there, and they launched my book. And I must tell you, there wasn't even one typographical error in it. That was the very first edition, which had a stamp of Palestine. Now, we had to change that cover along the way because Palestine was already a dirty word. You know, you couldn't, except for the stamp, which I insisted on keeping. So this was the launching of the book. And now we get to the end of this saga, which is the launching of the Hebrew book. And that was done at the Haganah Museum um, uh, about five or six years ago, uh, where the emphasis was placed on women who had served in Machal, far, uh, and, and that was very important, and uh, using that same picture. And again, I was very involved in the production. And this is a copy of the invitation to our wedding. Mr. and Mrs. Samuel J. Baraski request the honor of your presence at the marriage of their daughter Tsipora to Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Parat, Israel Defense Forces, Sunday, the 24th of June, 1951, 2.30 at the Embassy of Israel, Washington, D.C. And this is a picture of our wedding. And I just kept the card because we had such a nice greeting card. You know, the diplomats, Lieutenant Colonel, and this is Joseph Perron. And um, that's uh, Yosef. And this in the back is my sister who came from California to the wedding and didn't like my wedding dress. And that's another story. I was working at the consulate. I was so busy, I didn't have time to go out and buy myself a dress. So my mother came to visit, called me up and said, look, darling, I found a dress at a little shop in Madison Avenue, not far away from you. Go out during a lunch period and buy. You've got to have a dress. So I took her advice and I ran over there and I didn't have time. My head was on arrangements I had to make for the consulate. I had to make a train to get to my own wedding. But I never dress. So they showed me something that was, no, I didn't want white. I wanted blue. So whatever it is, <laughs> I had a very nice dress, but it, I wouldn't have chosen it because it was too tight at the waist and too busty. Whatever it is, it wasn't my favorite, but I had a dress. So you got married. I got married. My sister took one look and said, is that all you could find? And I decided, and why am I telling you this? Because my mother is shown in all the wedding pictures wearing an old dilapidated... Yeah. What happened was, she may have seen my dress till the night. I had that that she had bought in a different color. My mother had a much better figure than I. She was a beautiful woman. And she okay. didn't want to upstage me. So she had and she it. went to one of the friends of the embassy, who <coughs> was Mrs. Tudakov or whatever her name was, one of the benefactors. Who and just took a dress? And, and took a dress from the closet. So that was the story. Thank you so much. Um, of course we can go on for hours, but I haven't got the time and neither do you. But I, well, I, I enjoy it. Nobody else is interested in it. Yeah. Purple fishman is a... Maybe it's a freezing, so it's just a second. No, purple fishman is a small fishman son. And his brother works for, or has books for, the Chaim Bialik Association. They were the Zionists. They were 
our Zionist friend in New York. And this is all the stuff I ever wrote to the Jewish Jerusalem Post magazine. I just what years were you together. writing there? Sorry? What years? writing all the time. The last one was... Uh, usually on the 20th anniversary, the 30th anniversary, the 50th, and they always got back to me. I don't know what would be on the 60th, because they either quoted from the book. Or <laughs> this is a record in itself, very exciting. What no, I'm looking no. for, I can't find. No, no, no. Which is the wedding picture showing what my mother was wearing before. <laughs> <laughs> no, my name No, that's any. Yeah, show it up, Yeah. Ah, okay, it's okay. I want to see. Not to be really. She had such good taste. Why would she wear? We only found out three years later when she visited me in San Juan. Did they come often to see you? Not really. Nobody had any money. My father really had ever had money. Your husband stayed in the army. Sorry. Your husband stayed in the army. He stayed in the army until he left in the early fifties and helped and joined what is today Africa Israel. Then it was Africa, Palestine. And they built Sabiyon. When did you live in Tepion? He was a construction engineer. So, Sweet Friar, does that name mean anything to you? The Friar, I was thinking of, but I couldn't think of his name when we were talking to him. Because she met him. He was the head of the... Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Sorry, what do you call the commission for the nuclear commission? I have no idea. That was prior to you? That, because that was Svi Friar. Oh, Svi Friar bought the seventh house in Savion. I didn't know. My husband knew them all. I didn't. Anna, I knew all the old times. I Anna, forget his wife. Miriam. Anna. Miriam Friar. That was his wife's name. Anna, Anna. Do, you, do you know uh, Anna? Anna? What's her name? I don't know her, but uh, when I was in New York the last Anita time, Anna? somebody Anna? bought Anna? me a book and asked me to uh, dedicate it to her because I can tell you what you mean. So she knows about me. But I can't find a way. It's a great question. Do you see a white one that's small? It would be white. I'm going to walk behind. Is that going to be terrible? A white one? Where? 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 The embassy uh, getting married. <laughs> Post I want you to see this side of the corner. I'm going to see this side of the also a donkey. <laughs> you did great. You did great with the also fit the parameters of our project wonderfully. We're creating a national database, a national archive. So the ideal is that within the next 12 to 14 months, we're going to interview about 1,000 people. A huge archive that anybody can get any story that they're interested in. So at some point, it's not worth the name. Yeah, it's all about the name. That isn't to say that I won't use your information to write educational curriculum. Exactly. So your, your story speaks beautifully to the American diaspora story. So there's a chance we would use part of your footage um, in a lesson plan for sixth grade students oh, learning about well, the Hagana. Okay, yeah.